This is a public meeting. Our meeting is being recorded and streamed live, so please be mindful of comments that may be picked up by microphones located throughout the room. Silence your uh, cell phones if you would, and if you're joining us virtually, please mute your um, audio. Even updated COVID protocols, masks are not required for a meeting, but you're certainly welcome to one, wear one if you desire. And at this time, I'm going to ask Nicole if you would please take roll call. Roll call begins. Jen Banks. Ben Calhoun. Present. Christopher Chung. Brian Clark. Phyllis Craig Taylor. Kevin Dick, yeah. Hayes Framey, Walter Gaskin, David Goss, Present. Daniel Go Gavoni. I'm sorry. Um, okay, Susie Hamilton. Present. Perry Hawk Harker, Arkita Howard, Steve Calhoun. Callan, Callan. Present. David Kelly. Carly Lohan. Mark McIntyre. Here. Ashley McLeod. Present. Tish Murphy. Here. Bob Peel. Here. Michelle Query. Greg Richardson. Dan Segovia. Here. Glenn Scott. Skinner, Jason Simple, Here. Justin Sosny, John Soki, Wit Tatel, Alvin Warwick, Marquita Welton, Present. John White. Present. That concludes roll call. All right, and we're going to ask our staff if you would please introduce yourself at this time. Alan Sandoval, Commerce. Brandy Ketisak, Secretary's Office. Patrice Bathia, Commerce. Nicole Williams, Secretary's Office. John Harden, North Carolina Department of Commerce. Jennifer Munt, North Carolina Department of Commerce. Gina Renfro, North Carolina Department of Commerce. Colleen Brown, Department of Commerce. Dana Magliola, NCDOT. All right, uh, again, this is a public meeting. North Carolina open meeting laws require that an ethics statement be read at the start of every meeting. In accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, it is the duty of every task force member to avoid both conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts. If any member has any known conflict or interest or appearance of conflict with respect to matters coming before the task force today, please identify it at this time. Also, please identify any conflict that arises with respect to any matter discussed during the meeting so that it can be evaluated to ensure that any inappropriate participation is avoided. Uh, so if we have any guests in the room today, we'd like for you to identify yourselves at this time, please. So, Nicole, if you will make the microphone available for our guests. Keith Petker with Petker Construction Company. Trey Wigman with Putker Industrial Services. Chip Kilmeyer, North Carolina State Port Authority. Glenn Anderson, Kate Fierro, she laughs. Jenny Harris, I'm just late, sorry. College of Engineering and Technology, ECU. Amy McMillan, College of Business, ECU. Doug Taggart, North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Lawrence Rouse of Pitt Community College. Uconta Dunn, Greenville ENC Alliance. 
Kelly Andrews, Pitt County Economic Development. <coughs> Angela Barger, NC State Industrial Industry Expansion Solutions. Sharon Painter, East Carolina University. All right, thank you. We're so excited to have everyone join us this morning, and uh, we hope that you will find this to be a very informative meeting. We do have some special guests, but before I um, acknowledge them, I want to thank East Carolina University, Pitt Community College, and Pitt County Economic Development for sponsoring our breakfast this morning. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to thank Greenville ENC Alliance for sponsoring the venue, this beautiful venue that we're in today. And so I would like to invite Dr. Rouse, President of Pitt Community College, if you'd like to make some comments this morning, we certainly uh, would love to hear you. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'd like to just welcome you to Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, Pitt Community College is the seventh largest community college of the 58 within uh, the North Carolina system. We're very proud of supporting workforce development and most recently have been uh, named as a partner with North Carolina A&T as we look at renewable energies. And we're also developing programs as we move forward to look at uh, electrical vehicles and others. So today's discussion is very interesting and we thank you for allowing us to at least sit in and hear some of the discussion that you will have today. But we're here to support any workforce development, particularly when it comes to renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rouse. We appreciate uh, the work that you're doing here. Dr. Sharon Paytner, Acting Chief Research and Engagement Officer for ECU. Morning. Welcome to East Carolina University, home of the Pirates. Um, we are thrilled to be able to have you here on our campus today and to, to have an opportunity to listen from and learn some of the things that will happen in the conversations that you have. Um, when they give a professor a microphone, you, um, you, you really go back in time to say, okay, so how long do I get to talk? Um, but um, I think I only have two or three minutes. And so I want to to help to acclimate you to ECU and some of the things that are ongoing on our campus. Last week was a big one. Um, we had commencement for 4,500 pirates, and um, it is a culmination of an educational journey that we think will end in a really strong workforce for North Carolina and some other places, so we're excited for the future for those new pirate graduates. Um, the other thing is to help you understand some of the things that are here and present in Greenville partnership with Pitt Community College and others is really important for us as we think about workforce development, think about things like sustainable energy. Um, having a College of Engineering and Technology is really important for the collaborations that it can create with our College of Business and with some of the arts and sciences and health and human performance. And, and I can stand here all morning and tell you about the things that are ongoing. We've got two folks here that are in the room that are listening to your conversation today with keen ears. And um, one of them tells me that I'm not allowed to say we're going to have a really big and exciting announcement tomorrow about a project that touches some of the work that you all are doing. But um, they can't stop me once they get a microphone. So. <laughs> we're excited about now that we're going to make tomorrow in sustainable energy space and in some of the things that will be upcoming. Um, as we think about supply chain and how wind energy and the Center for Sustainable Energy and the Miller School of Entrepreneurship and all the other things that are ongoing at ECU come together and collide with the work that you're doing. So welcome to ECU. Thank you for the opportunity. We are excited to hear and to host you. Um, please let us know if there's anything we can do to make your day more comfortable and more productive. Thank you, Dr. Painter. We are really excited to be here thrilled with the work that you're doing here at ECU as well. I'd like to introduce a couple of new members we have with us today. Jason Semple is Director of Business Development for Brunswick Business and Industry Development. He's a North Carolina Economic Development veteran, having served in various local, regional, and state roles since 2005. Most recently, he served as President and CEO of the Martin County Economic Development Corporation from 2015 through 22 and before joining uh, Brunswick Business and Industry Development. So Jason, thank you so much for joining the task force. Also, we're thrilled with John Zoka, who's a former 
member of the North Carolina Rep uh, House of North Carolina Legislature. <laughs> so with the 45th District, uh, which covers Fort Bragg, Southern Cumberland County, and portions of the city of Fayetteville, John chaired the House of Energy and Public Utilities Committee. He's a retired lieutenant colonel and of the US, of the US Army, and he's also a small business owner. However, beginning next month, uh, next week, Monday, he will be CEO of the Conservative Energy Network, a nationwide nonprofit. So we're thrilled with having uh, John Zoka uh, join us this morning as our newest member as well. Thank you, John. I wanted to mention uh, and thank you to Yukonda Dunn for arranging a visit with our task force for Greenville. South Greenville Elementary School yesterday. We had a wonderful time. Uh, several of us went and met with second graders to introduce them to the concept of clean energy and offshore wind. And it was really um, a fun event for us. I hope it was fun for them. They seemed to enjoy it. Those hands were up the entire time. Lots and lots of questions. And we also have people who decided they want our job. So I think our mission was accomplished um, with with that. So again, thank you, Yukonda, for arranging that visit for us. And I also want to thank um, to St. Williams, who is the U.S. representative for the German Offshore Wind Initiative. He provided books for us to give to the kids, uh, wind energy for kids. So each kid got a book. They got a personal windmill, or pin, well, pinwheel, maybe not a windmill, and uh, some bubbles. So it was fun for them. It was fun for us. And that is something that we are endeavoring to do before each task force meeting now that we can start uh, visiting local community, local schools and the communities that we're hosting our meeting in to start uh, working with not just elementary school, but middle school and high school children as well to talk about clean energy and the work we're doing here. I want to just take a moment to, uh, well, well uh, several of us in the room attended uh, we went on a trip to Denmark at the invitation of the Danish Energy Agency, and we're going to hear a little bit about that later. But um, as you know, we have an MOU with the UK, and we also have a new, an MOU that was entered recently with uh, the Danish Energy Agency. We have partners all across the globe who are very interested in our success here in North Carolina and trying to help us uh, develop this new sector for us and um, not make mistakes that were made in the past to learn best practices. So we're really thrilled with the opportunity to partner with uh, entities like the Danish Energy Agency, the UK, and others. So um, we will be hearing a little bit more about that later, but I just want to mention that our agenda today is really focused on supply chain development. And as you know, that is a big issue for success in this offshore wind sector. So with three offshore wind lease areas awarded off the coast of North Carolina, we have the Kitty Hawk Wind Energy Area and two Carolina Long Bay wind energy areas that are up for development. It's essential that we, as a state, ensure that we have not only the talent pipeline, but the supply chain to be able to support these projects and to enable North, North Carolina to get our fair share of that $140 billion that's projected in capital investment along the eastern shoreline for this industry. So with that, we um, have several topics today that we will be uh, focusing on uh, North Carolina supply chain competitive advantage, supply chain opportunities from a developer's perspective, financing for offshore wind development supply chain, and ISO certification for supply chain readiness. Again, it is really essential that we start thinking about how we can help support our businesses in pivoting to support this, in this industry. We do have businesses that are already supporting it, but small and large businesses can get a piece of this action too. And, and uh, we want to position ourselves to do everything that we can to help make them successful and support them in this endeavor. So right now what I'd like to do is move through our agenda and go ahead and have our team present some highlights from 
the International Partnering Forum, and that is an off, uh, uh, nationwide, well, national, I should say, business network of offshore wind, annual conference on offshore wind, and uh, some really good information came out of that, as well as our um, delegation to Denmark. We're going to present some highlights from that. So Jennifer Munt and John Harden. I don't think Andrews has joined us today, so we'll be hearing from Jennifer and John. Good morning, NC Towers. It's great to see everybody here in Greenville. I really appreciate you. And more tech. Really appreciate you being here in, uh, either in person or joining us virtually. John Harden and I are going to do a little, uh, a little scat through our two big conference trips that we took with some of our colleagues who are here with us today both to Baltimore, Maryland at the end of March to attend the International uh, Offshore Wind Partnering Forum um, and then to the Wind Europe 2023 conference in Copenhagen, Denmark. So um, bear with us because we're, we're going to ad lib this a little bit, but I think that between some pictures and just some narrative, you should hopefully capture uh, the essence of our experience, uh, both at IPF with our with our national colleagues in offshore wind, and at Wind Europe with our international teams, as we all strive to advance the sector in a meaningful and an intentional way. So I'm going to pull these pictures up and see see what happens. Okay, y'all seeing that in real time too? I'm just gonna. That's the whole. Is that good? See. All right, while well, this thinks its way through, um, I'm trying to find that. And I will add that the delegation to Denmark um, and visit to Win Europe was led by North Carolina Secretary, Commerce Secretary Michelle Baker Sanders. We had team members from North Carolina A&T and Carteret Community College, so it was really a very informative uh, experience for them as well. Back to Jennifer. Okay, thanks, uh, Chair Walton. So um, we pulled down a, a mistaken folder, so we don't have pictures from IPF, but what we can share is that we had a really great delegation, not only from the Department of Commerce, but we were also working with our partners at the Economic Development Partnership, where they had determined that IPF was going to be a conference in which they invested mightily, and so they helped support the uh, the a booth, as well as our Smart Power delegation lounge area that we shared with our friends from Maryland and Virginia that we've done in the past several years. And so, in addition to us from Commerce, and I might uh, I'm looking to my friends around the room to help. Help me with my memory because my memory is is uh, just shy of terrible. Um, we had EDP represented. We had our friends from the ports there. Um, Chips colleagues Lance uh, Kenworthy and Aaron Brott were there representing ports interests, and were able to meet with uh, businesses and manufacturers who might be interested in some of the ports facilities and assets to support offshore wind. And we had. Um, Mark, done. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. you kind of uh, from from the uh, East North. North. <laughs> <laughs> the ENC Alliance. Thank the you. Green from Mill the ENC, ENC Alliance, Alliance was there representing this region, and I was going to say, Mark, help me out. I can't remember your new VP. Um, is there. Thank you. Yeah. Anu Ganton was uh, there representing Duke Energy. Um, not to mention there were there was representation from other North Carolina interests at IPF as well, including the developers with leaseholds off the coast. So we had folks from Avangrid, Total, and Duke Energy Renewables uh, there, really comprising a holistic representation of the state's interests while we were in Baltimore. Um, on the first day, John and I 
were able to take a tour of some of the uh, Baltimore region's offshore wind assets. The state of Maryland is investing mightily with, uh, uh, with private partners to redevelop Sparrows Point, which was the former home of Bethlehem Steel on the, uh, uh, up on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's a, probably about a 300 or so acre property that is probably a brownfield and requires a whole lot of upfitting and upgrading. But they have an agreement with U.S. Wind. Is that right? Or, or OW? I can't remember. <coughs> too, many, too many details are spinning around in my mind. But there's a developer that is involved with that project, an offshore wind industry developer, rather. And they are going to be uh, building uh, huge infrastructure equipment at Sparrows Point. And we got to tour the port. We got to go to um, the IBEW site in, um, in, in Baltimore City and see the training facility where they are providing training and on-the-job training and learning to apprentices in electrical equipment and engineering. Um, and where else? Oh, and we also went to MITAG, which is the Maryland Institute for Training in Maritime something. MITAGs. I'm not going to remember all of these acronyms. I have a hard enough time remembering what an NC Tower stands for, so forgive me. Um, and so we were able, well, I should say, John was able to participate in a simulation that they have. It's a it's a 360, it's like imagine you're going into um, an observatory of sorts where they have simulated the, um, the, the, uh, the captain's uh, space in a ship and you can tell how much maritime experience I have when I describe this. And they can simulate the, um, the offshore wind arrays in a couple of the projects that are planned in the Northeast. So they can use these sim this simulation to model what it, will look, what it will be like for mariners to go out and maneuver around in between and amongst these towers in, you know, prior to them being installed in, um, in reality. So um, I say John was able to participate in that because for those of you who know me a little better, that uh, I don't do well with, uh, with offshore activities that involve a little bit of uh, boat and ocean movement. And so even being in this simulator, I, my inner ear was screaming, get out, get out. So I did. And so um, I was able to actually go and sit in the control room where the techs were able to you know, show really uh, difficult high seas where we were able to simulate, you know, dusk and dawn and other types of weather conditions, uh, really high winds and uh, watch the people in the room react to it. And I was feeling a lot better in, in the control room with the computers around me. So I'll let John And I'll just that. add one quick note there that it's good that Jennifer moved to the control room because of those of us who were in the the, the boat or the artificial Shoot. boat Shoot. could say to the control room, hey, crank it up. Let's make this really rough. And it got rough really fast. And it was much rougher than any actual boat or ship that I've been on in the ocean. And it was very realistic. And uh, the Vitac facility was very impressive. They have people come stay for weeks to, to do training and it's a, a rare facility in the U.S., and it's something that we should look to partner with and um, potentially see what we could do in North Carolina that's related to that. That's right. And so that kind of captures our first day. Um, on Tuesday, there were a host at IPF, there were a host of um, kind of by invitation only uh, workshops and conferences. Chair Welton, do you want to take a moment and describe the um, the Mid-Atlantic Suppliers Day that you participated in? Yes, there was a day that uh, the Business Network dedicated for small businesses who were interested in getting into the offshore wind space. And so there were some major developers, Ocean Wind, I think Dominion was there. A number of different developers were there that presented um, and answered questions, particularly about how to and I'm pleased that we'll have um, a speaker later from NC State to talk about ISO certification and the importance of that to be 
on the qualification list for some of these companies. So that was a day that was um, preceded the actual conference, but it was an opportunity for small businesses to learn about opportunities in the offshore wind sector. And I'll humble brag on, on Chair Bolton. She, put, she uh, moderated a panel mid, midday through that workshop. So we appreciated the North Carolina representation at that, at that workshop. And unfortunately, John and I weren't able to participate because we were, uh, we were similar, similarly obligated to participate in a workforce development workshop that the Business Network put, put on that had probably about 100 participants representing all facets of the industry. And where we heard from some leaders at uh, the Department of Energy, we heard some, from some union representatives and others about what the what programs and uh, policies are being put in place to help entice and create this workforce to support the industry as it as it grows at lightning speed. Uh, that takes us, I think, through Tuesday. On Wednesday and Thursday was the conference proper. And I know several, we were all kind of scattered to the winds attending either informational sessions. I want to say there were probably close to 75 or 80 informational sessions. There were 12 separate uh, topical tracks that we were all trying to navigate between. They, they went from things as, you know, as simplistic, if you will, as like offshore wind 101 and what are, what are we talking about here in that space to uh, more um, more accelerated types of topics like power to X and how do we move from offshore wind to hydrogen and uh, other industrial applications, mm -hmm. vessels and maritime needs, how we grow the steel industry, um, workforce, supply chain, everything under the sun. It was a really comprehensive and great conference. On the last day, I was able to participate on a mid-Atlantic panel on how we grow our rural workforce supporting offshore wind. And so on that panel with me were friends from Maryland and Virginia, including um, one of our fellow task force members, Arkita Howard, who <coughs> we together spoke to what we're doing in our respective states and within our regions to try to grow rural workforce opportunities to support offshore wind. Am I forgetting anything about IPF? I've much better summary than I could have given. I just have a couple of um, things to add. Um, Jennifer may have noted this, but there were approximately 3,800 people at um, the IPF conference, which is the most that they've ever had. This is the third IPF that I've attended, and every year the, the number is increasing. And the, the content is, is also evolving to away from le it's less preliminary information now and more advanced supply chain information and really kind of where the, the rubber meets the road um, <coughs> um, information that, that people need to actually start putting turbines in the water. I should also note one of the sessions at IPF was, um, it ran all day for a couple of days, was called the Startup Alley, if I remember correctly, and they had, they had um, several companies there, probably a dozen or so companies that were able to present and um, their technologies and their companies and how they would serve the industry. And um, there was one company from North Carolina, so we had good representation out of the 12 or so that were there. Fathom Science, correct? Yes. Correct term. So Science. Jennifer Werlow was, was there, and along with her um, teammates, if we had the pictures, we're still working on getting the pictures, but we actually um, had a, uh, some pictures taken with them. They actually demoed their um, technology several times. They had kind of a pitch session, lightning round sort of deal that um, was very impressive. Really good coverage for North Carolina in general. Um, North Carolina is a known entity now in the offshore wind space. People seek us out as far as our booth. And the fact that we have partnered with Virginia and Maryland to, through the Smart Power Agreement also helps our visibility. And everyone we speak to really likes the, um, the tripartite agreement that we have because it helps lower barriers um, across the states. So it would. That conference was um, a success overall. Very good. Agreed. And I think that's a great segue for us to talk briefly about our trip to Copenhagen to 
Before you do, there was one takeaway I do want to mention from IPF, and uh, that was a part of Liz Burdock, who's the president of Be Now, um, her presentation during the Small Business, business Day. Um, that North Carolina is among the states, particularly on the eastern seaboard, that are in the offshore wind business. North Carolina is the one state that doesn't have legislation supporting it. And so that's one of the things that's important for us to focus on and work with our legislators to make sure that we're positioned to be as competitive as possible with our neighboring states. Um, we do have the executive order that Governor Cooper put in place, which is the reason we are in existence as a task force. But in terms of um, legislation that really makes the statement to big investors, those uh, developers who are thinking about where they're going to have the greatest success, they're looking for legislation to help uh, inform their decisions and make them feel comfortable that this is a state that they can succeed in. So I just wanted to mention that, that that's important for us to really keep in mind as well as part of our work. Thank you, Chair Walton. And so with the few minutes that we have left, um, and I'm happy for you to jump in and share your, uh, your reactions and, and thoughts about our trip to Denmark, and I will um, quickly kind of take us through some highlights of these pictures. And so uh, Chair Walton, John, and I, um, and as mentioned before, Secretary Sanders was leading a North Carolina <coughs> delegation to uh, Copenhagen to meet with our partners from the Danish Energy Agency in, um, in their Ministry of Climate um, and Energy to begin the execution of the MOU that we signed with them at the beginning of March. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in my, in my remarks in the next presentation. But it was really important for us to really, you know, put our eyes, our eyes on what it is exactly <coughs> we're doing and actually see these turbines in the water spinning up, you know, clean energy electrons at capacity that is powering industry and homes all across their country. What's really interesting about Denmark um, is that they are a country of only five and a half million people, yet they are, you know, squarely on track to be carbon neutral by mid-century, if not before, and they're able to do that without any nuclear resources, which I found to be a very interesting uh, statistic. They have um, several gigawatts of offshore wind power already in, uh, in operation off their coast. And they are, like we've shared with you all before, they are the global leader in offshore wind development, having put the first turbines in the water back in 1991. So they are the preeminent experts, and we are able to leverage that experience and talent and help us build our bench here in North Carolina so that we can grow this industry efficiently and uh, strategically. And so on the first full day, Several of us met, maybe John, while I'm talking, maybe you can pull up some relevant pictures, maybe these. Yep. Yep. Um, we met with our counterparts at the Danish Energy Agency where they uh, gave us some uh, interesting overviews about the work that they do, and especially some of the innovative and um, uh, kind of cutting edge types of technologies and programs that they are putting in place in Denmark. Uh, this is uh, this is us earlier in the morning. Secretary Sanders was, uh, I think, en route from the airport. She flew overnight and joined us mid-morning for this meeting. And so um, she's always on the go and always moving. So that's why she wasn't uh, pictured in that uh, in that caption. But she probably arrived 15 minutes later. And, you know, in Denmark, they're looking at things like building energy islands out 60 plus miles off the coast to house infrastructure and support manufacturing and the generation of power while, you know, for not just Denmark, because they only have five and a half million people, but to sister countries throughout the EU. And, and I think what's really important, and John mentioned this as we were wrapping up our remarks about IPF, is the recognition that our smart power agreement has generated not only nationally but internationally, it mirrors and looks a lot like some of the agreements and, and, um, 
and collaborative efforts that are underway in, amongst other countries in multinational arrangements to help advance clean energy investment and development. And so um, it's just a really interesting uh, analogous program here that if we can start showing that we're operating and working in a similar fashion, that we could probably generate similar interest and um, success. This is a picture from the conference itself, Wind Europe. John, I'll let you speak to that. You spent a little bit more time on the floor than I did. So um, if you think the IPF conference is big with 3,800, you should attend the Wind Europe conference, which was billed ahead of time as having 10,000 people. But I think the final numbers were closer to, what, 16 or 13? It was 14,000, 14, yeah, 13,800 people. With they 500 had, vendors. Yes, 500 different vendors. They had three different exhibition yeah. floor rooms in, in the convention center for Copenhagen, which is a large convention center. And uh, it was overwhelming. There were so many vendors, so many people, and um, a lot of standing. Uh, I thought I was in pretty good shape until I stood up for hours on end and realized how hard that is. But um, we made Anders Victor, who you can see in the picture right up next to Jennifer. He's my, um, he's my half twin out yes. of my brain there. With the EDPNC ahead of time scheduled um, a dozen or so meetings with companies. Um, many of them on the showroom floor, but some in private meeting rooms as well. And all of them, as, as Jennifer noted, are very interested in North Carolina. It's clear that they have much more experience than they do than we do, and they want to help. They understand that in, us, in order for North Carolina and the U.S. in general, for the market to grow, we cannot do it by ourselves. And, and they want to help, one, because they want to help in general, but two, it will also help them because they'll get business relationships out of that as well. Keep talking and I will uh, find some more pictures. So as John said, you know, we were, we were a small contingent among, you know, 14,000 or so others who were in this space. I would also note that Wind Europe is not just exclusively offshore wind. It does uh, encapsulate <coughs> onshore wind industry as well. But um, it, nonetheless, that's a, a lot of people convened all in the name of growing a clean energy sector, which was pretty fantastic. And so... Those, th that was the middle of the week while we were there, and then Thursday and Friday, we were really fortunate to be able to take um, a, a road trip uh, across Denmark. And we were able to visit uh, the Vestas Blade Factory, where they are um, doing the primary and preliminary molds for their new 18 or 15 or 18 megawatt uh, turbines. And so we were able to walk their factory floor. We were able to see where they are building the current, I think, eight or 10 megawatt blades, which are uh, twice the length of this, of this room, if I'm, if I'm estimating uh, approximately. This is a blade, and you can see the tip of it is well beyond us. And maybe, John, if, if you could uh, zoom back out a little yeah. bit. Here's our, here's our delegation on the, on the road trip. Um, the blade even goes about 30 feet uh, beyond where the picture was taken to the, that way, to the left, or to, yeah, to your left. So just recognizing again the enormity and the massiveness of size of this equipment really uh, brought this home for us. We, um, so that was on Thursday afternoon. On Friday we, got, we were really fortunate to take a tour of the port of Esberg. Which the, which the Danes dub their energy port. It's a really interesting site because not only do they have a coal, uh, a coal plant there that's generating electricity, they also have a, a, a wind array both onshore and then several miles offshore that we didn't get out to visit. Um, and at the port, we were fortunate enough to get a, a drive around and see uh, Siemens, Vestas, and um, uh, GE turbines all, um, all set out and ready to go out for um, delivery and installation. 
We were also able to see blades and tower components. And it was really just remarkable how much this port has invested in the, uh, in, in the what's necessary to support this heavy equipment that, you know, each one of these, each one of these pieces here, that's the, that's the nacelle right there. That weighs probably, I don't know, 100 tons. Something like that. What, 40 elephants, Marquita? Something like 40 that. Elephants. <laughs> <laughs> According to the children's book we read yesterday to the second graders. So, I mean, this is, these are not, uh, this is not light equipment and it requires, you know, significant infrastructure to support it. What we learned from our, from the experts at the Port of Esberg is that, you know, they showed us that it had traditionally been a, a fishing port and supported uh, an industry of, of fisheries for, you know, for probably several centuries. And over time, as you know, quotas and other uh, regulations came into play, fisheries really started, uh, you know, becoming more and more minimized. And they were looking for other opportunities to create op to create jobs and investments in that port city. And offshore wind and and the ancillary and related um, industry really kind of came in and saved it. And more than that, there are now more clean energy jobs supporting the port than any other sectors combined. And so they really see it as a significant success story. We were able to take a boat ride um, right along the um, right along the port and in a crew transfer vessel, similar to what we would see um, workforce going out to uh, service. Uh, um, facilities once they are built off the coast. These vessels, they travel pretty quickly so they can just shoot people out to the main vessels um, and, and make some quick turns. And this one only held, there were about eight or ten of us total riding on this boat. Um, and it was just really fascinating. The, the larger vessel behind it is, um, is, is the is the vessel on which the crews will stay for several weeks at a time. They will have um, alternating uh, staff go out for a couple weeks, come back for a couple weeks, just like they do with the oil and gas industry. And so um, just being able to see the uh, magnitude and the size of these ships and understanding what it is they're doing and not to mention their intrinsic commitment to safety we were told even when we were walking through their office building to hold the rails, <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, that's fine." And we probably it probably spent we probably spent more time putting on our safety and security equipment to get on the boat than we did riding <laughs> around the port. So, any other thoughts about that? Safety first. Yes. They said safety first about a hundred times, yes. and and they they live it, and they have a very good record. Um, because of that, that commitment to safety. Yeah. And then after we visited the port, we drove about an hour to a company called Wellcon, where they build towers for offshore wind installations. And um, John's gonna pull up a couple pictures from that visit. And it was really interesting to see from soup to nuts where they get the, the, uh, the plate steel and they showed us the machinations by which it goes from just plate, plate, you know, flat steel to circular steel and how they fit the flanges and this other uh, necessary equipment. We got to walk through very quickly the, the painting and the coating part of the facility and really see from soup to nuts how these towers are built. And what was really cool um, and hopefully we won't see too much more of this in the future, was that one of, the, or, or a host of these towers were being built for the Vineyard Wind Project, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. If I'm not mistaken. And so some of these towers that we saw in Denmark are going to be installed off the coast of Massachusetts in a few short months. And so that was really interesting to see and why I'm saying I hope that we don't see much more of that in the future is because we want to bring that supply chain here and not have to pay those additional costs for shipping over the Atlantic Ocean and bringing that equipment here. We want to build it here and then just ship it up and down our coast. And so you can just see the enormity of this tower uh, compared to us like little munchkin people in front. So um, again, it was an incredibly informative and uh, 
and telling experience. And Cho Welton, if you want to weigh in on our Copenhagen slash Denmark um, adventures, I will yes. turn the floor to you. I do want to comment about the ports, you know, with it with the port of es Esmer, is how they pronounce it, um, being the leading port in the North Sea for offshore wind. Offshore wind is only one third of the business they do. I mean, that's a big operation, but they do everything else that, um, say, for example, a port like NC Ports does. Um, but I, I think it's important to keep in mind, like, as we consider what we can do here in North Carolina, that offshore wind does not mean that we can't do the businesses that we're already doing in our ports. And so um, as we move forward in considering how we can attract some of these businesses to North Carolina, our ports play a key role in that. One more picture of iconic Copenhagen. Yes. So we did stay primarily in Copenhagen, although we did um, travel outside of Copenhagen. And this is one of the classic views of Copenhagen that you'll see if you, if you go there. Happy to take any questions about our recent travels. Seeing no questions, thank you, John and Jennifer, for that update, for that report. And Jennifer, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you for our um, Clean Energy, for your Assistant Secretary of Clean Energy report. Thank you. I'm just going to lean on Alan for his expert tech assistance to make sure everybody can see what I'm sharing. Oh, he, he's saying we're in trouble for relying on him. I hope that's not the case. And one housekeeping thing as Jennifer Trent is uh, transitioning, if you parked in the deck and you got a ticket, please see Nicole if you want to have your parking ticket validated. Thank you, Chair Welton. Thanks, Nicole, for validating our parking. That's a, that's a bonus. So again, you all know me, Jennifer Munt, Assistant Secretary for Clean Energy Economic Development, with your quarterly update on all things offshore wind that have happened since we met last. And so I'll take us through a quick um, update on federal and state-related activities. Um, and with that, we'll get started. We've mentioned before, or I've shared with y'all before, the ongoing effort between the White House and the Federal State Offshore Wind Implementation Partnership. I mentioned that this partnership was launched last June. And if you look really carefully at the picture, um, let me see. Right here, there's Governor Cooper. He was zoomed in on this. So just to show, yes. North Carolina was, is represented and has been since the very beginning on this partnership. And so uh, John and I, uh, as well as several others, um, Susan Fleetwood on our team has been able to join some of these calls on the supply chain working group effort. And really that's an effort to help, uh, to help the country develop a domestic supply chain for offshore wind, recognizing, as we've heard over the past several months, that there is a dire need for us to grow our, our onshore um, supplies to support the growth of this industry. You, you recall last, uh, last meeting, we heard some updates about the two NREL reports that came out indicating that we need you know, tens of billions of dollars of investment in domestic supply chain. Um, to support the goals that the administration has set out to achieve 30 gigawatts by 2030 of offshore wind deployment. And so what we've been doing in this smaller working group of this partnership is to come up with a conceptual framework for a potential MOU to be signed amongst the party states to establish a regional approach to developing this domestic supply chain. And so We've been working through, pre, through many iterations of this conceptual MOU. And while the earlier versions contemplated that all of the participating states would receive a proportional or somehow predetermined or preassessed proportional uh, share of any committed content, and we've defined content as any goods, materials, jobs, services, infrastructure, and research that go into an offshore wind project. But 
now, the latest iteration, taking feedback and comments from all of the part participating states, the latest version of this MOU contemplates and encourages the development of regional agreements that strengthen collaborations between individual or specific states. So for example, if, if North Carolina, if we were to uh, sign on to such an MOU, it would direct us within the next nine months of joining this, um, this MOU agreement to meet with and undertake agreements with other states within the MOU consortium and develop what framework we are comfortable operating within. It might not include a proportional share of, commit of committed content, or it might. It really depends upon the intricacies and peculiarities of each state as participants. And so it really gives us, as members, the flexibility to participate. And really, what we're trying to do is everything we can to fill these supply chain gaps. There are two that have been articulated and predefined as national priorities, and those include the development and ultimately putting in the water of the vessels that we need as well as securing enough domestic steel to support the fabrication and, and manufacture of all of this infrastructure. Um, also, uh, which is, which I don't think is a, is a small note, I think it's worth noting that the federal agencies as a part of it, they would also sign on to this MOU. And as one um, strategic lever, they would be able to provide technical and potentially other uh, facilitation support to, to provide for appropriate implementation. Other quick updates on, um, well, this is a little bit of a mess. Oh, because we're sharing through Adobe. So forgive the, uh, the messy slide here. Um, I mentioned at the last meeting that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking for modernizing the regulations under which they implement offshore wind energy development projects. The rules, when they were first promulgated, came out, of, um, came out in 2009, and so they've been in place for the better part of 15 years, and throughout the progress of various projects, stakeholders, developers, and BOEM all recognized that there was a, a serious need to revise the rules to make development more efficient, uh, go through the process more quickly and help developers and ultimately ratepayers save money on the back end. And so um, there was initially a 60-day comment period, but given the uh, complexity and the, and the length of the proposed rules, I think there were about two to 300 pages long, um, Bellum extended that comment period to 120 days and the comment period just closed um, a week ago, Monday on May 1st. Um, I'm not sure what the time frame is going to be, but Boehm received about 250 comments from all manner of stakeholders, including uh, project developers, environmental NGOs, uh, state and local government um, officials, federal agencies, uh, uh, regional fisheries associations, I'm trying, am I forgetting anybody, the military weighed in, um, and so that was all, um, that, that's all now under BOEM's review and evaluation to determine how they move forward with the rulemaking as proposed. And I will update y'all on the progress of that. The other update I wanted to share was about the status of the Central Atlantic uh, draft wind energy area. As you uh, might recall from the last meeting, that BOEM released draft wind energy areas for public uh, comment back at the in the fall. North Carolina, as well as several other stakeholder states, submitted comments reacting to those proposed areas. And the two that we are most interested in are here in Area D, off the off our northern coast, and then way out here beyond the shelf in Area F. And so we submitted comments pursuant to those two areas. Um, but what has come up in the past uh, several weeks, and y'all might have seen some news about this, and we made mention of this in the most recent uh, NC Towers newsletter, were some reactions that, were, that came from the Pentagon about the location and identification of these areas, especially proximate to the Chesapeake Bay. And so there were some folks from the Pentagon who had shared maps identifying 
that some of these areas up off of Virginia and Maryland presented some real dire conflicts with military operations and security. Um, and they put that out there and several news outlets picked up on that and said that offshore wind is going to uh, negatively impact military and this is a big problem. But really, if you read beyond the headline, what we see is that according to Bloomberg, that the maps only represent initial stages of the evaluation by the Pentagon and that they are committed to finding ways to accommodate leasing in this region. And so again, it just speaks to the ongoing negotiation and coordination that Boehm undertakes with all of the federal partners to ensure that they go through an, a more than adequate and, you know, dare I say, robust effort to fully deconflict such that these areas provide are, are safe and do not provide con or do not uh, present conflicts to any ocean user, uh, namely the Department of Defense. And so we'll be watching that keenly. But I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarification about that: is that the Department of Defense does not say these are no go, and that they're going to work to mitigate and uh, identify areas that will be able to be co-used um, for offshore wind purposes. The other effort I wanted to share, because I don't think I have previously um, described this, and it was news to some folks who I presented to um, over the weekend at an NC Bar Association environment section meeting, was the existence of the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, or FIPSI as they like to go by. It's a 15 member um, it's made up of 15 plus members representing federal agencies and bureaus and offices within each that all come together to help move more efficiently huge federal infrastructure projects. So that could include DOT projects for major highway or rail projects. But what it's also come to encompass is offshore wind just because of their scale and the fact that they cross multiple agencies' jurisdiction. And so they include the Department of Agriculture, the Army Corps of Engineers, obviously Defense, like I mentioned, the Department of Commerce and NOAA, uh, NOAA and NIMPS that fall within that agency, EPA, uh, the Council on Historic Preservation, Council on Environmental Quality, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, every acronym you can think of from the federal government, they're involved in FIPSI. And what they've done to help improve transparency and coordination to both to across the agencies and for the public is to create a permitting dashboard. And that looks a little bit like this. And so let me, let me just move this little guy right here. And so um, Ashley, this might look familiar to you. Um, if you go to the dashboard, you can search by a project agency, and the agency is the lead agency that's conducting, is responsible for moving the project forward. In this case, it's BOEM. Um, and then you can search on sector or state where they might be located. And so I just searched on federal offshore wind, and here come all the projects, and they seem to be listed by alphabet. And here we see Kitty Hawk North. And if you look at it, you could say, oh, this is where it is. It's in progress. Right, Ashley? As well as, Kitty Hawk South. as well as Kitty Hawk South. And so just as a reminder, that's where Kitty Hawk North sits off our coast. And then if you click through on that, um, there we go. Um, you can see a little bit more information about that particular project from the permitting dashboard. You can see that right now there are Zero out of 11 environmental review and permitting processes that are completed. Um, and you can see here who is the lead agency, who the project sponsor and the coordinators are from both BOEM and the developer. And then over here, you can see a permitting timetable about where all of the various permits and authorizations are um, based on today, and that was uh, last Thursday. And so according to FIPSI, that's where Kitty Hawk North sits as of last Thursday. Ashley, you can correct me if there's anything. No, I think it's updated only because that's not our project director anymore, but oh. we'll, <laughs> we can fix that. 
Absolutely. You bet. So anyway, just a, a quick uh, a, a quick touch on FIPSI because I thought y'all might be interested in that, and I'm gonna speed up because I got a lot to talk about in terms of our North Carolina updates. Um, there's nothing new from the last time we met regarding Kitty Hawk North. We still expect, or the COP was submitted, and we still expect the draft EIS sometime by the end of this calendar year with respect to Kitty Hawk South. There have, you know, we anticipate seeing the COP published once it's deemed complete by Bellum sometime this calendar year. No, it's, it's, well, for say that again? We're waiting to see the, the deemed complete COP for Kitty Hawk South, correct? Yeah, and then that will work into the TEIS, where you talked about not the environmental studies have not been done yet, but those will then be part of it. Exactly. Thank you. Um, and then we've got Carolina Long Bay. Uh, between Total and Duke Energy's Duke Energy Renewables Wind, we anticipate the site assessment plans will be sit, submitted over the next few months for geophysical and geotechnical um, assessments, and including the installation of net buoys out in the leasehold to determine weather and other types of conditions out on the water. And my understanding is that Duke and Total have begun engaging with their with their uh, recently hired staff in outreach um, with local stakeholders, including tribal entities, um, fisheries, and um, just uh, regular members of the public. Uh, speaking of outreach and engagement, last month, no, in March, six weeks ago, we held an open house in Brunswick County. Uh, that top picture, goodness, we gotta figure out where to stick that so we can actually see things. Uh, that top picture is uh, our, some of our members on the task force, Michelle Query and Whit Tuttle, joined by Natalie English from the uh, Wilmington Chamber, uh, speaking to some individuals who were interested in what are the economic development opportunities vis-a-vis -vis impacts on uh, fisheries or tourism uh, from offshore wind. Um, and my understanding is that in total we had about 100 people participate in the event. And... Um, it was, uh, I believe, a success. And I think from that, we had several people sign up to receive our newsletter going forward. And, um, and, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. And since February, when we met last, we, all of our, our colleagues here combined, we have participated in no fewer than 15 outreach meetings with local government or community organizations meeting with um, advocacy groups. Last, like I just mentioned, I met, I presented last week to the North Carolina Bar Association on offshore wind, and just really putting out the word about what it is we're doing through NC Towers, through Commerce, through our partnerships with other organizations to try to grow this industry. And this is me speaking um, back in February to the, um, or was it March? I can't remember. In March to the Martin County Board of Commissioners. They had invited me to come talk about offshore wind. And so some other updates of salient since we met last. Uh, just a few weeks ago, North Carolina joined a consortium of uh, nine other states uh, called the um, Fisheries Compensation Initiative. And I mentioned this in February as a possibility, and it has now become a reality. Um, this initiative was spearheaded by the, an organization called the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind, which is an independent organization that has a track record of providing objective strategic guidance on key issues in the sector. If this initiative itself is being led by Chris Olaf, um, who is um, a who is uh, well known in this sector, and if I say her name, you probably uh, know uh, to whom I'm referring. And she is being supported by folks at the Consensus Building Institute as the uh, finer uh, details of this framework are developed. And so, these member states that are highlighted in blue on the right side of the screen have decided to come together and develop a foundation to establish a compensation framework and a governance model for a regional funding administrator to manage claims for fisheries compensation as it relates to offshore wind construction and operations. These states are support the development of a common framework 
that, um, that is robust and uh, built on data and a process for developing the mitigation that is consistent, equitable, and transparent. The approach is meant to increase efficiencies for, and coordination and reduce uncertainty for all sectors, whether they be developers or fisher, or fisher people, and will help encourage developers to design projects in a way that meets the, um, uh, the, uh, the impact hierarchy, where the first level uh, in that hierarchy is to avoid, and then the next level is to um, minimize, and then the next level is mitigate, and then the next level beyond that is compensate. And so we're going to do everything we can to avoid any impacts to fisheries that could negatively affect uh, a fisher person's ability to um, pursue their livelihood or their hobbies. Um, and if and when they don't, this fund will be available and administered by a third party to um, help compensate for any losses that those fisher people might um, endure. Um, the delegation from North Carolina is being led by our very own NC Towers member, Trish Murphy, and she's being supported by um, her colleague, Chris Bat Savage, in the Division of Marine Fisheries at DEQ, Daniel Gavoni, who is our um, federal consistency um, uh, policy uh, lead at the Division of Coastal Management, uh, Peter Ledford, who's the Governor's State Energy, or Clean Energy Director, who you all have met before, and myself. And so we'll all be representing North Carolina on this initiative going forward. Talking about but, um, studies and the budget, a couple of updates I mentioned at our last meeting. The um, proposal that Commerce submitted um, with uh, lead staff from uh, UNC Charlotte, uh, ECU, Elizabeth State, or Elizabeth City State University, uh, E4 Carolinas, Clemson University, and the South Carolina Research Authority to the NSF for a Type 1 Innovation Engine grant to establish what we've deemed clean engines, and, here, and here's another acronym I'm never going to remember. So it's the Clean Energy to Generate Innovative New Economic Systems Innovation Engine. And so we expect to hear an announcement from NSF tomorrow. And so stay tuned. We will be, uh, we will be interested to see those announcements, and we'll be putting out press, uh, uh, press releases as well. Um, in commerce, we are going to be undertaking a new um, rebooted uh, clean energy slash clean transportation workforce needs assessment. It's going to build upon the work that the agency conducted in 2019 pursuant to Governor Cooper's EO80, directing the agency to do such an assessment. And we are working out the finer details on what that's going to look like. Um, and so I'll have more information about that at our next meeting. Um, other efforts. With our smart power partners in Virginia and Maryland, we are negotiating the development of a regional supply chain and workforce assessment to be conducted by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Labs. This would be a really refined and detailed look at the three states' assets and gaps in supply chain and workforce that uses the national report that NREL conducted and released over the past year as a basis and then dives deep on our three state region so that we really have a much more granular and defined understanding about where our three states are in the in workforce and supply chain and developing recommendations in that space. And this, to clarify the difference, this would be the smart power study would be for offshore wind specifically and the prior study I mentioned that Commerce is going to undertake is for clean energy and clean transportation holistically, so all sectors. Um, DEQ, and uh, through its state energy office, is working with Duke Energy in an application for U.S. Department of Energy Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership, or GRIP, proposal for significant funding for offshore wind transmission. And it's my understanding that this proposal, as it's contemplated, would, would include the construction of new transmission capacity that could help the state uh, meet our offshore wind development goals by connecting to these lease areas and moving the electricity that's generated 
into our load centers. As you all know, our load centers are not at the coast, they're in the Piedmont and beyond, and so we need adequate uh, grid to be able to support that. And then lastly but not least, the governor's budget. Just want to mention one significant item that he had recommended for the legislature's consideration, and that was a $50 million transfer from the um, the, I want to get this right, the Economic Development Project Reserve, uh, $50 million to radio, to, from that reserve to um, infrastructure investment and upgrades at Radio Island to support economic development. It's my understanding that that, uh, that, that line item was not included in the House's budget when, it, when, it was, <coughs> when, it, when they sent their proposal over to the Senate. But I understand the budget still has a long way to go, and so that means that there's opportunity for us at Commerce and for those of us on the task force to uh, make our interests known and clear that we would support such um, investment. And then lastly, I want to mention the MOU, which was signed about a month after we met in February. As you can see a screenshot from the live signing event that we held on March 1st at the top of the screen and then at the bottom of the screen that's a picture that we took when we were meeting with uh, the executive director of the Port of Esper and the delegation uh, of those of us who were there and the uh, minister from the Danish Energy um, or from the ministry uh, Christopher Botsaw is is there in in the front on the left in the in the white um, in the white button down shirt and so this MOU is designed to take advantage as I mentioned before of the Danish experience in offshore wind not only have they put you know several gigawatts of wind power in the water off off their coast they've also seen huge investments in the supply chain as, as illustrated just briefly by um, by the pictures and the discussion that, that uh, John Chairwelton and I shared by visiting Vestas and the tower manufacturer and the port, you know, there, and that's just a small glimmer of what all is <clears throat> happening in Denmark as it relates to offshore wind. Um, they also have a significant uh, research and <clears throat> innovation. Um, uh, significant research and innovation collaboration ongoing amongst their academic institutions and their uh, technology hubs. So they are really on the cutting edge. And what's interesting about the country of Denmark, by order and under their law, because, and I mentioned before, they only have a population of, of five and a half million, so they're, they're just under, they're just about half of our population. They've done everything that they can within their own boundaries to reduce their climate and carbon emissions. And so by directive from their government, they are, they're required to share their expertise in clean energy sector with countries and subnational governments around the world. Right now, uh, the country of Denmark has 24 governmental and sub-national agreements executed with, across the globe, and in total, those account for 60% of global emissions. And so, North Carolina is really proud to be one of those 24 uh, agreements. The other uh, U.S. Agree, the other U.S. agreements that are in play, or the other entities within the United States that have agreements with Denmark include the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, uh, NYSERDA in New York, uh, New Jersey, BPU, which is their, um, their public utility authority, uh, California Energy Commission, uh, BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the U.S. Department of Energy. And um, we already talked about conferences, uh, so I won't I won't um, belabor this, but it's the season of conferences, and we've got more on the um, on the slate coming up. Um, here, just mentioned that uh, some of our intrepid members of the task force, while uh, Chair Welton, John, and I were um, in Copenhagen, they uh, they presented 
and participated on the um, on the floor at the State Energy Conference and Molly representing NC Towers and answering questions from participants in that conference. And I think with that, I'm going to take questions and close it out. And I know I'm way over time, so apologies, Madam Chair. Yeah, we're a bit over. So do we have any questions for Jennifer, Representative Soka? Thank you. Uh, I have just two questions on the NREL study. What's the smart power that's going to drill down on the three states? What's the timeline? When are we going to actually see the results? Of so we are working out the, the, uh, the construct of that study right now. Maryland is leading the negotiations with NREL, and actually I have a, a, a meeting scheduled early next week with our counterparts in Maryland to understand the timing of it. I would hope that we would have some initial results by hopefully the end of this calendar year, but I have to look back at the, the draft scope of work because it was put together um, in about November, December of last year, and so I think the time's gonna have to get pushed out a little bit. Okay. And one other question on that, the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, um, that certainly looks like it's very useful in tracking the permitting going through there. Uh, are they also looking at, or is there any other federal agency looking at uh, perhaps revising some of these permits to make it easier for industry to comply? Well, industry as a whole, well, or just for well, offshore well, wind? Whatever industry it might be, whether it's building towers or whatever. That, I mean, it takes like seven years of permitting generally, isn't that about right? Yeah, so... Anybody um, looking at shortening that somehow? Indeed, and so that uh, notice of proposed rulemaking that Bellum put out earlier this year that I mentioned in my remarks a little earlier, that is aimed at you know providing efficiencies and reducing the time necessary to get steel in the water for an offshore wind project. I know that there are efforts that are being um, you know batted about in Congress right now to improve efficiencies within all energy project development, whether it be renewable or fossil driven. And I'm not sure what the status of those various um, uh, vehicles is right now. Thank you. Sure. Do we have other questions for Jennifer? Is that to clarify what she mentioned, Radio Island of the Governor? That's the Carter County, which is adjacent to the North I'll just repeat that for everybody who might not have heard on the mic. So uh, Daniel Gavoni from Coastal Management, he indicated that Radio Island, the property that uh, was uh, recommended in Governor Cooper's budget for a $50 million transfer from the Economic Development Reserve, um, is located adjacent to the Moorhead City Port in Carteret County and is, uh, and is owned by, in large part by the Port's Authority. Thank you, Daniel. Any other comments or questions for Jennifer? And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and really, we're going to talk about North Carolina's uh, competitive advantage as a supply chain. Bear with me. Try and get to where I All right, here we go. Uh, good morning, still. I'm Dana Magliola. I'm the statewide multimodal freight and logistics program manager at North Carolina DOT. Uh, I serve as our supply chain subject matter expert. and. Um, as uh, Chairwoman uh, Welton mentioned, you know, really connect infrastructure to industry. And that's really what we're here to do and, and what we're here to, to talk about. I'm also the uh, a staffer on the um, probably the best of the subcommittees, the Infrastructure Subcommittee of NC Towers. So just to give a plug for my subcommittee there. Um, <laughs> And uh, as always, honored to be a part of, of this August group. Uh, I'm also, as the kids would say, a, an offshore wind power stan. And uh, love this sector. And I think one of my favorite experiences of all time is getting a chance to go offshore to visit the two installations, uh, which you'll see here behind me. I don't think you can understand what it's like to see th this installation until you've seen it it's just a it's a life-changing experience i know jennifer had a life-changing experience on the on the boat ride out there <laughs> but <laughs> couldn't couldn't i can't pass up that opportunity i'm sorry all right so here's what we're going to talk a little bit about today we're going to talk about the uh opportunity for offshore wind supply chain development where we'll go over our multimodal freight network and talk about the industrial ecosystem here in North Carolina. 
as well as some of the workforce and business development resources. Let's kind of take it back to the very beginning, though, and establish a baseline. And that baseline here is what is the supply chain? And quite, base, quite honestly, it, it's very simple. The supply chain is the flow of information, goods, and funds. And as we've developed as a sector and as everyone has learned what the supply chain is, complements of COVID and toilet paper, uh, information is perhaps the most important. I know money talks here, but information drives the supply chain now. And so one of the things that in really developing this slide deck, uh, I'm actually sharing a slide deck with you that captures a lot of resources that I've built with uh, GIS and some other information um, that serves to help tell the story of the supply chain in North Carolina. But this is the basics. One of the key supply chain investment truths here is the supply chain assets follow the marketplace. And I think one of the greatest examples I can point, and it's a good local example, and that is the investment we've seen in the cold chain, in temperature controlled storage. Um, you know, this is an industry or sector of, of, the, of the supply chain that is booming and one where the money is following that interest. Uh, in North Carolina alone, there's an estimated $500 million of investment in cold chain storage and warehousing. Now, this is not offshore wind related, but I really wanted to uh, illustrate and articulate that the point that that investment is following the marketplace. And if we talk about what the marketplace in offshore wind is, we're talking about a $140 billion opportunity by 2035. So the marketplace is there, the investment will follow, and the supply chain in North Carolina is going to be the linchpin for the success of that effort. So 2035, right? That seems like a long distance, long time away. It's not. So what is the time frame for investment and when is our window of opportunity? And quite frankly, it's right now. You know, this is a screenshot of the report that BVG Associates did when we first started this conversation and captured the supply chain opportunity for offshore wind. And this is a significant economic opportunity. I'm pulling something uh, really one of the most important quotes in that study. And I'm going to read it to you because North Carolina's existing strength in quality manufacturing and its enduring manufacturing friendly environment that exceeds that of any East Coast state to supply the physical supply chain for offshore wind power sector development. That is the linchpin and that is North Carolina's competitive advantage, the supply chain and manufacturing in our state. It's a windy place. The Wright brothers left Ohio for the right reasons. Uh, there's lots of wind on the coast. I'm a sailor and I love how much wind we have in this state, but the manufacturing, the manufacturing is our competitive advantage. And it's more than just manufacturing of tier one, just sort of the, the largest components. It's manufacturing tier two, tier three, really the suppliers of the industry as a whole. And, uh, you know, the, the blades are very uh, exciting, the scale, but all of the widgets that go into that, that's a big opportunity for North Carolina. And I think it's important to recognize what's here today. And what's here today is a robust industrial ecosystem, one with assets and infrastructure statewide. Offshore wind has this coastal focus. I mean, just by definition, offshore. There's not a lot of offshore in Asheville, but the statewide opportunity in North Carolina is strong. Domestic availability of raw materials and the capacity to serve this industry from cradle to grave is also a strength here in North Carolina. And all of that, all of that stems from the strength of our supply chain. I'm going to jump into the actual assets. We're going to talk real details on real facilities in North Carolina and things that are important to the operation and growth of the supply chain in North Carolina for offshore wind. First and foremost, uh, I wouldn't be a good DOT employee if I wasn't here to highlight the infrastructure that we can offer as a state. And right here is a capture, a full screen capture of the North Carolina Priority Multimodal Highway or Multimodal Freight Network. And this is a collection of rail, road, aviation, maritime, uh, what am I forgetting? 
I mean, there's every mode of transportation serves freight in this state, and it's captured here in this map. But we're going to jump a little bit into some of the details. To start with, the North Carolina Priority Highway Freight Network is nearly 4,000 4, miles statewide of routes integral to the movement of freight. It's a lifeline for local, regional, and our, and our national economy. North Carolina hits far above our weight in manufacturing and in industry, and the Priority Highway Freight Network helps bring North Carolina products and services to the world. Moving freight in North Carolina via highway is easy, with excellent roads and resources to support routing, planning, and industry as they look to do business in our state and look to grow their business here already. As you can see, the Priority Highway Freight Network reaches every corner of our state and allows for efficient and sustainable transportation in urban, suburban, and rural areas of the state, all of which are important to maintaining our robust manufacturing ecosystem. There's really not a corner of this state that the Priority Highway Freight Work Network does not serve. This Priority Highway Freight Network includes the backbone of the national freight transportation the National Priority Freight Network, and as you'll see, the freight network serves to connect North Carolina communities with our many freight and supply chain assets statewide. Beyond infrastructure, we're all available to provide assets, sorry, we're available to provide ample resources for route and supply chain planning, including information, data, and relevant analysis. Part of the, the emphasis of developing these resources here, not just to show you this map, but is to be able to turn over some of the information, data, and analysis that we've built into explaining and articulating our supply chain to industry who's looking to grow here, who's looking to invest here, and figure out operationally how do they do business in North Carolina. Beyond the highway network, I'm going to take us on a grand tour of our many supply chain assets in North Carolina. With the development of offshore wind power, we'll start with the maritime and port assets, which are integral to the development of this sector in our state, our region, and our nation. Our two deep water ports at Wilmington and Moorhead City feature a host of capabilities from intermodal and container services to the broad range of bulk, break bulk, and out of gauge project cargo. These facilities are world class and serve customers in, with the best in the nation productivity and customer service. And there's a nice shot of both Wilmington, the waterfront and container service, and the port of Moorhead City. And if you look close, you'll actually see some staging uh, for blades that were going to the onshore wind facilities um, in Pasquotank County? For Quimmins. Thank you, Dave Goss. I'm looking right at him. And Pasquotank. I knew it. I knew both. All right. So by now we're all quite familiar with the capabilities of our ports at Wilmington and Moorhead City, but I'd like to spotlight the scale of operations at the Port of Wilmington. This nearly 300-acre facility features nine shoreside berths with nearly 7,000 feet of wharf frontage, including on-dock rail. Beyond the quayside, the amount of warehousing space and cold storage reflects a significant investment made by the state of North Carolina and led by the talented leadership team at North Carolina Ports. This investment in increasing capacity, increasing air draft, and providing North Carolina Ports with the capabilities to serve larger and larger ships allows for a direct connection between North Carolina and the global economy. Pictured here first, I've developed a drive time analysis known as an isochrone. This reflects a, the reach of a truck within an eight hour drive. That eight hour drive is consistent with the federal regulated hours of service. And it shows you really a, a, a realistic understanding of the range of service by truck uh, that's possible from this particular asset. And you'll see I, I've developed isochrones from all of our uh, major supply chain assets here in the state. North Carolina ports suggests that there is over 70% of the industrial base uh, within 700 mile range of the ports of Wilmington and Moorhead City. And if you look at not just the port isochrone, but all of our drive times from our assets, we're talking about a major national reach uh, to major markets, including the fastest growing region in the country across the southeast. I also think this is a whole lot more realistic than those circles you see in a lot of diagrams where you say, oh, you can reach this whole circle, because that takes into account speed limits, traffic, congestion, and really gives a planner, say they want to locate a facility and they have a supplier that's in Augusta, Georgia. Now, one, we want to bring that supplier into North Carolina, but we want them to know if they grow in North Carolina, 
that they have easy access within a one within a truck drive to their suppliers. <clears throat> Just up the coast in Carteret County, the Port of Moorhead City offers a dynamic platform to serve cargo handling beyond containerization. With no air draft restrictions and quick access to deep water, the proven experience of handling project cargo, bulk and brake belt cargo, Moorhead City is a key asset in developing the offshore wind sector in North Carolina, both for offshore turbine installation and maintenance, which is something we see a lot of attention on, as well as serving the shoreside supply chain across the state that will power the entire sector of the U.S. East Coast. Much like the Port of Wilmington, the Port of Moorhead City provides an easy access to multimodal bullpen of transportation options, including on-dock rail connecting the National Norfolk Southern Rail Network, easy highway connections with the Priority Highway Freight Network, barge service, and more. From the maritime assets that North Carolina offers to support the growth and development of the offshore wind power sector, railroads also offer an unprecedented access to the industrial hinterlands in our state and in our region. With more than 2,000 miles of rail, including national service by two Class I railroads and more than 20 short-line railroads, North Carolina's rail network is a backbone for manufacturing in our state and a key resource for growing offshore wind sector in, in, in North Carolina. Here's a broad view of the rail network, and as you'll see the Class I railroads, they're uh, highlighted in blue and green, and short lines in uh, purple or whatever color you might want to call that. North Carolina has one of the most robust and active rail networks of any state in the nation. Across North Carolina, we maintain a priority freight rail network, including efficient access to the ports of Wilmington, Moorhead City, and the Port of Virginia in Hampton Roads. For companies planning on investing in North Carolina, we can provide information, data, and analytical resources on the statewide rail network that take the guesswork out of the equation when tr planning transportation to and from supply chain providers that's vital to positive outcomes. Now, one of the things, too, that I, I don't do in my slides is I'm not going to read this whole slide to you, but I will make sure that this is available to you because there's a lot of data on here that is important and possibly relevant. Um, but I've, I know we're on a time crunch, so it's a great shot of one of our assets here in North Carolina, the uh, electric uh, gantry cranes at the Carolina Connector facility. Um, I started today's presentation with a focus on North Carolina supply chain as a competitive advantage. And for the offshore wind power sector to grow in North Carolina, it will be a statewide effort. And there are ample inland assets that will play a role in our success. I'll spend some time now on going through a catalog of inland supply chain assets from inland intermodal facilities to aviation facilities to access points for industry to the transportation network. This is a great shot of the uh, Antonov, the world's largest cargo plane in service at Global Transport. Unfortunately, the Antonov was destroyed recently, so RIP the Antonov, but the capabilities remain at Global Transport. Great shot here of the uh, intermodal facility at um, Norfolk Southern Charlotte Intermodal Facility. And you'll see there's some runways in the background. It's co-located uh, with Charlotte Douglas. Here's a broad overview of the assets, which I'll talk about hereafter. Really, this map highlights where they are. And you'll see there's a lot of concentration around our urban and suburban areas. But again, the key to this whole thing is that the transportation network provides efficient access no matter urban, suburban, or rural. Opened in November of 2021 and supported with significant investment by the state of North Carolina, the Carolina Connector Intermodal Terminal in Rocky Mount provides North Carolina's supply chain with a robust connection point to, national, to a national rail network. This 330-acre facility is strategically positioned on the I-95 corridor, the gray lady of the East Coast there, and perhaps the most important significant highway freight asset in the nation. It provides direct access and efficient access to the Midwest via the, through the Port of Wilmington and Wilmington's Midwest Express. CCX, as it's called by shorthand, provides our state with advanced intermodal capabilities. And not only that, the area around this facility is one of the most active and uh, sought after for industrial development and economic development.
North Carolina Ports operates an inland intermodal facility in Charlotte, the Charlotte Inland Port, which connects our maritime supply chain to the major industrial and workforce concentration in the Charlotte metropolitan area. Positioned on the I-85 and I-77 corridor, freight corridors, the Charlotte Inland Port already serves important industries in our state and includes a broad spectrum of manufacturing sectors. This is going to be an important asset as we look to develop the second and third tier supply chain with manufacturers who already exist and are active in North Carolina, and as we look to empower a workforce that is statewide. Within a stone's throw of the Charlotte Inland Port, C CSX also operates an inland intermodal facility at Pinoca Yard. Many of the benefits of the Charlotte Inland po Port are applicable to the Pinoca Yard, and the volume of activity at Pinoca Intermodal Facility provides economies of scale for any relevant supply chain development supporting offshore wind. Clearly, intermodal activities in Charlotte are robust, and Norfolk Southern's in on the game as well. As I showed you the picture earlier, the Norfolk Southern Intermodal Facility in Charlotte is no different. This very large facility has not only ex is operating today, but has room to grow and is co-located at Charlotte Douglas International Airport. And although there is rarely a case where a rail to aviation freight transfer happens, uh, the capabilities are there. And the, it, this, this, this opportunity supports the resiliency of an industrial supply chain in North Carolina. Quite often, uh, supply chain uh, planners and transportation planners will try to uh, put their freight on truck and rail because of the cost. But when you absolutely have to have it there uh, in short time, that Im important resiliency capability of aviation and air cargo uh, plays a big factor. So again, this is another important asset and the co-location there for the Norfolk Southern Yard is important. In the Green, uh, Greensboro Piedmont Triad area, the Norfolk, Norfolk Southern Class 1 operates an intermodal facility that is strategically positioned along the same I-85 and I-77 corridor with a quick shot to the I-81 corridor, which is a backbone of industrial tran uh, transportation on the East Coast. Uh, if you've ever been on I-81, you've seen more trucks than cars. It's an interesting route. Uh, and this uh, intermodal facility is, is a, a stone's throw away from that. This is quick access to the Port of Virginia and um, the Norfolk Southern National Rail Network. One of the most unique supply chain assets that North Carolina has to offer is the North Carolina DOT's uh, NC Global Trans Park. It's a multimodal aviation and industrial park located in Lenore County in Kinston, North Carolina. This 2,500-acre facility features one of the longest runways in the state of North Carolina and one of the longest runways on the East Coast and is an active industrial park with on-site composite manufacturing and composite manufacturing workforce training. This is a great example of where the supply chain asset and workforce development come together to support industry development with partnership through the community college. And this has enabled the growth of aerospace in our state. So, the offshore wind sector has lessons to learn from other industries that have grown in our state and the aerospace development that we've seen supported by North Carolina Global Transpark is a great case study in what's possible with collaboration and it's super relevant to the growing nascent offshore wind sector in North Carolina. And I'll, I'll jump back into this, we'll talk a little bit more about workforce training, but the on-site composite uh, training facility there that was established in partnership with Spirit Aerosystems, that is a fuselage um, provider for um, Airbus, um, is, is world class. Um, the students that are training there have the opportunity to work on relevant, modern, and, and up-to-date equipment. They work on that equipment in training and they walk right onto the production floor and have the training and skills that they need to, to hit the ground running. Interoperability between transportation and supply chain networks is a key strength for North Carolina. And it's one of the most important inland assets and inland capabilities that our broad network has to offer. And that is through transload facilities. A transload facility offers easy and efficient transfer between freight, of freight between rail and road networks. And there are 13 active, 13, did I get that right? Yep, 13 active rail served, highway served transload facilities in the state of North Carolina. There are also smaller um, 
sort of less uh, active transload facilities. So this number is something you, you can hear larger numbers, but really the ones that are, are most relevant here, are, there are 13 of them that are statewide, and you'll see that they are positioned strategically. Right now, this is shown against the rail network, but as you can recognize, uh, they're very close to highway as well. That is the important part of that transload. This is one of those assets that's really important to the agricultural uh, sector of our state, but the capabilities are there, and that connection between the two modes is important for offshore wind. North Carolina's robust aviation ecosystem provides further supply chain capabilities and quick access to a global marketplace. North Carolina features 72 publicly owned airports, including 13 active cargo handling airports across the state. Together with quick access to air freight, North Carolina Aviation, DOT's aviation, is a national leader in the growth and development of the UAS or drone space. As a part of the BEYOND program and initially one of the few participants in the um, IPP, the, I believe it was the initial pilot program, uh, which allowed our state to pilot new programs with UAS and drone applications out of line of sight. NCDOT has the flexibility to pilot and deploy innovative UAS solutions for supply chains. As my colleagues in aviation like to say, uh, North Carolina is forever first in flight. That's a good line, isn't it? Uh, also down here I'll show you our air cargo op capabilities are robust. The three most important airports to that are Charlotte Douglas, Piedmont Triad, and Raleigh-Durham. They carry the bulk of the volume of cargo in our state, but I'll highlight a smaller example and an industrial solution provided by Rocky Mountain Wilson, co-located in, uh, in that community with the Cummins Diesel Manufacturing Plant. They use that facility regularly for air cargo. So if there's a supplier or a part of our supply chain that's relevant for offshore wind, chances are there's going to be a cargo handling airport nearby to support their growth. Here's an overview of the airports in North Carolina providing air cargo services. And more than just a map, this is an example of one of the data resources that we have to offer. This is a GIS, a geospatial information systems uh, data source, which helps with planning, network design, transportation activities. And as a company starts to develop their supply chain footprint in North Carolina, we can provide these resources for them. And just a quick shot of all of the airports in North Carolina. So beyond assets, North Carolina's manufacturing acumen, experience, and capabilities will be the key to success in the growth and development of the offshore wind power sector in our state, our region, and our nation. One of the most important resources in the growth of offshore wind power in North Carolina is data and access to information about relevant manufacturers in the state who can support the offshore wind power sector. The Southeastern Wind Coalition, and props to our colleagues from uh, Southeastern Wind Coalition, for developing this asset, have one of the best and most relevant information resources in their database of suppliers. This database has grown and now includes more than 120 companies across North Carolina who are self-identified as relevant to offshore wind. And you'll see here the concentration, but you also see that there are companies that are currently supplying the industry and companies that don't yet supply the industry but want to. And I think that's an important point as we start to talk about how we grow manufacturing here and the resources and capabilities we're able to develop that help manufacturers in one space pivot to serve the offshore wind sector. This is a great map too. I had uh, used this map on a previous slide uh, presentation months ago and the number of uh, entries has gone up so I ca captured a new screenshot so props to, to you Catherine on that. David, Mark, there's a question from Mark. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, there's an icon that isn't in the legend. And it's the green plus sign looking thing. It just what that means is. there's more than one, it means they produce more than one type of, you know, more than one icon on there. So if you click on the green plus, then it, say, it might say that they produce I see. And, and Dana, can you address that in the market? Yeah, so Mark asked what the icon with the green um, plus and stripes is that's not captured in the key. Um, and good eye for that. I didn't notice that. That is where one provider offers multiple services to the industry sector. So you can click on that on the interactive map and it'll provide you more detail on that. And good, another good question. question. Yes, sir. How did they know to um, add themselves to this list? 
Uh, I'd love to recognize uh, our member, Catherine, from the Southeastern Wind Coalition to answer that question. Okay, thanks. Um, there are a variety of ways that the map has been populated over time. So we've been working on this map for almost a decade. Um, we have, uh, we normally have um, an intern who is out looking for companies, will reach out and say, hey, would you like to, um, to join the supply chain map? Um, we've done uh, more targeted efforts. We have, um, partnered with a number of other organizations, including ACP, back when they were AWEA. They have a supply chain map, and so we've shared data over the years. Um, so some of this comes from some of those national maps. Uh, we've also shared data with other states, North Carolina, Virginia. Um, the map does include the entire Southeast. Uh, and so there are, are a number of ways, and we, uh, we utilize interns liberally to try to keep it updated because oftentimes there are organizations that'll go out of business or um, that kind of thing. So it should be fairly updated. But yes, we're, I, I mean, word of mouth is by far the best uh, opportunity we have to, to get companies on here. All right, thank you, good question. I'll continue to another resource, another data and information resource. North Carolina is a manufacturing powerhouse, right? That's something we've established and, and definitely a point I want you to walk away from my presentation with. One of the other important data and information resources available to support offshore wind power sector growth in North Carolina is our Manufacturing Extension Partnership, the uh, NIST National Institute of Science and Technology Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership System, which is a nationwide system of uh, state uh, resources that are dedicated to helping grow manufacturing. This is housed at North Carolina State as a part of the industrial extension or industrial extent. What is it? Industry, Industry expansion solutions. I worked there. I should know the name. <laughs> um, but much like your ag extension service, they serve to support manufacturer growth and resource development. We'll hear more about that later. Um, but the MEP maintains a database of manufacturers in North Carolina, and here's a heat map that we've built from their data that highlights um, this, uh, just sort of the concentration of manufacturers uh, overlaid with that statewide priority freight network. So there are more than 1,700 entries on this database, and I think one of the things that's most important about this is it's searchable by the map, it's searchable by providers by industrial categories, NAICS codes or SIC codes, if you're familiar with sort of the uh, lexicon of acronyms in industry. This is going to be one of those resources that as we start to identify companies that are in one space and provide them with opportunity in offshore wind, that we're able to drill down on what they do and where those capabilities are there to pivot. Here's a great resource that was developed, just another data resource that shows your direct rail served and rail related industries across the state. And I won't dwell much on this, but it just highlights that the data and analysis and information that's available here to help provide a geo reference for companies and really the companies are looking at location, 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 right? This is another asset where they can start to plan and understand how robust and how resilient our supply chain network is. North Carolina has several active uh, mega sites. In fact, we used to have more, and one of the biggest challenges we have today is that we are running out of mega sites. But these are large, industrially zoned, well power served, transportation supported in industry concentration areas. There are five major mega sites still remaining active and in soliciting uh, investment in the state of North Carolina. This is led by our colleagues at the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. And this is just a quick map overview. Chatham, Siler City, Person County, Kingsboro, CSX Select, Mid-Atlantic Industrial co-located next to the International Logistics Park near in New Hanover. Or Brunswick, it might be in Brunswick. It's Brunswick. Giddy up. All right, the Brunswick, the Brunswick guy keeps me on, on, keeps me honest. Appreciate that. Uh, here's some more details on it. I, again, I won't spend much time on this, but I, some of the things I want to highlight here is that there is a foreign trade zone uh, that is associated with 
each and every one of these mega sites. And quite honestly, there's a foreign trade zone that is associated and covers each and every one of our important supply chain assets statewide. And if you're unfamiliar with the foreign trade zone, this is a unique uh, federal program that allows manufacturers to position inventory and either create uh, late stage manufacturing that's exempt from taxation and that is then exempt from import taxation uh, and it helps grow North Carolina manufacturing. Um, I think that's a quick summary of the foreign trade zone. If you have more questions about foreign trade zones, there's definitely more information out there. But again, this is one of those things that you have major industrial developers are looking at ways to, to provide uh, a tax uh, benefits for when they manufacture, and this is a great recruiting tool for us. Um, the connectivity to international airports, to the freight network, is also another important part of these mega sites. Here's a little bit more on those foreign trade zones, and here's a great definition down here. Um, without formal customs entry, um, they can, you can avoid excise taxes and other import taxes. And of course, I'll leave this with you. Um, some of these are managed by uh, different agencies. North Carolina DOT manages uh, Zone 214, which covers much of the eastern and southeastern <coughs> part of the state. Triangle J government or handles the uh, sort of the capital area, we'll call it. Uh, triad, Piedmont Triad is managed, manages the um, Greensboro, that sort of greater triad area, Charlotte Metro, and then even in the northeastern part of the state, we have overlap from uh, a foreign trade zone that's managed out of the state of Virginia. Here's another sort of nuance to industrial recruiting, and that is the tier designations for our counties by economic um, health, and I'm probably not doing this justice, but if you look at some of the state uh, tiers, you've got sort of tier one are counties where there is little or uh, there is a strong need for more industrial development, we'll put it that way. And there are opportunities for funding and grants and support to grow industry in those areas. Again, this is something that I'm gonna defer to our friends at Commerce on, but it's something to highlight. When it comes to industrial recruiting and development, there's not only infrastructure assets, there's data assets, but there are policy and economic incentives to make it worthwhile to look at North Carolina to grow, not just in, in industry in general, but this offshore wind power sector we're looking to grow. So we all know this background, right? I think I've hit it here. One of my favorite memes is this one right here. What is the point of this? Don't make me tap the sign again. The supply chain is North Carolina's edge. Beyond the supply chain, and I will not do this justice because we have a talented and, and uh, august subcommittee dedicated to workforce development, but I want to give you some idea of some of the workforce and industrial development resources in our state. First and foremost, colleges, universities, community colleges, there are, community, there are, there are educational institutions in every possible corner of this state, and so many of them. 58 community colleges serving all 100 counties. Workforce and skills and, and development uh, that is tailored for industry, that is tailored on a partnership basis with companies. I mean, really, this is a white glove service that is provided by the community college system that if you are an industrial manufacturer or you are a commercial developer and you need a certain skill set, the community college is your first stop to partner on developing those skills and recruiting and training that workforce. You know, I highlighted the Lenore Community College program at the Global Trans Park, but there are so many examples of this statewide. The UNC system, uh, which includes North Carolina State University, I have to give a shout out because we start with that UNC thing. Thank you, go pack. Uh, provides 16 universities with advanced degrees across the state, also relevant to the development of this sector. Uh, some of the programs in um, engineering that these, pro, that these schools like UNC Charlotte, NC State, NC a and um, Elizabeth City State, these colleges and universities statewide are providing that are super relevant to offshore wind development. And then private colleges and universities, and there's a ton of them. Um, this is a robust educational ecosystem here that supports industrial growth 
If there is a need and a workforce skill, there is an application, an educational institution that can tailor a solution to that. EDPNC has regional industry development zones, and much of this is tied to dedicated resources from that agency that will help on a local and regional basis, will help you understand the landscape of industry there, that will help you understand what it's like to work in those communities and has dedicated skills, expertise, and experience that will help manufacturers grow in these sectors. The Department of Commerce has prosperity zones that, again, helps classify and catalog the different areas of the state and the different capabilities and characteristics of each area and has dedicated resources to work with manufacturers to grow and recruit industry there. The community colleges I mentioned earlier, not just are they ready to tailor a, a white glove solution in partnership and collaboration with industry, but they have an active and robust apprenticeship program statewide. And this is one of those secondary pathways that we see growing, especially as we start to engage uh, K through 12 education systems on opportunities for workforce and opportunities for career in this nascent industry. Apprenticeships are also super relevant and the Apprenticeship North Carolina program is one of the best in the nation for producing quality graduates and, sol and solving workforce development, workforce needs for industry in our state. Offshore Wind is in a position to start to grow this need and grow the demand for those apprenticeships in North Carolina. And there is no shortage of people dedicated and resources dedicated to growing workforce in our state as highlighted by the NC Works program and our workforce development boards. And if you talked about how these are regional, these are hyper-regional. These are getting it down to an even more tangible and manageable area where those resources are well tailored, knowing those communities. And this is the kind of local on the ground knowledge that an industrial developer, an industry or a company looking to grow in North Carolina, they need to engage at this level. So they know when they build that factory and they get incentives for X number of jobs, that they can find the people and the skills to fill those jobs. So thank you for bearing with me. I know we've covered a lot of assets and one of the things I want to do is turn over this slide deck and then provide access to all of the GIS and data resources that I've developed to go into this deck that's really just been an overview of what's out there. This is an asset and a resource that we can share with companies looking to grow here and looking to relocate here and I want to arm all of you in your conversations when you go out there to say come to North Carolina, offshore wind sector, come to North Carolina, here's why the business case makes sense. Here's where our competitive advantages are in our supply chain. This is a full state opportunity. This is more than a coastal play. This is one area, one thing that runs, and I love this, this painting uh, by the uh, Barton College uh, longtime uh, artist, Chris Wilson, uh, from Manio to Murphy, from Murphy to Manio. This is a statewide play. Supply chain assets across our state will enable our success. And the opportunity here is manufacturing. Don't make me tap the sign again. The supply chain is our competitive advantage, and we have the resources and expertise to grow this sector. And remember, it is a long game. I know we heard about, what about cutting down the window of permitting and the long time frame? But we're in this game for the, for the long run, and we have the opportunity to gain the most of any, co any state on the East Coast and perhaps in the United States when it comes to securing offshore wind development in our state. And I think that was it. All right, thank you, Dana. We appreciate uh, that wealth of information you shared. Great report. Um, any questions for Dana? And uh, just so you know, all of the presentations that you're seeing today are, will be available and may already be available on the NC Towers website. If they're not on there now, they will be on at the conclusion of this meeting. So um, a lot of information that you are seeing, it will be available for your review later. Yeah, absolutely. And please uh, make note of my contact information. I'm happy to work with you on providing some of these resources, data, spreadsheets, spend time with you on tailoring solutions and pitches. You know, if you're working with a company, call me up and let's, let's put together the right proposal for that audience. Um, Chairwoman Welton, thank you for the opportunity to present and thanks everybody for your attention.
Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our next presentation. That was it. It deserves applause. I want to invite John Larson to the podium. He is with Dominion Energy. He's, he joined Dominion Energy in 1996 and is currently the Director of Public Policy and Economic Development. He's held various leadership positions in business development, alternative energy technologies, as well as transmission construction and operations. He's well versed in offshore wind through his experience in the development and early permitting activities for Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind, the CBOW pilot project. Currently, a large part of his time is spent on Dominion Energy's business to business workforce development and community outreach activity as the company moves forward implementing the requirements of the Virginia Clean Economy Act, including the 16,100 megawatts of solar, 5,200 megawatts of offshore wind, and 2,700 megawatts of storage, with the objective of maximizing opportunities for Virginia's endeavors subcontractors and suppliers. So join me in welcoming John Larson. Also joining us virtually is Maynard Smith. Maynard is the business development, diversity and compliance consulting expert. He currently manages Maynard, I don't know if I mentioned with US Win. Maynard is Maynard Smith is with US Win. Um, he's a business development, diversity, and compliance consulting expert. He currently manages minority business enterprise outreach for business development services for U.S. Wind's historic Maryland Renewable Energy Project. Maynard also supports diversity and inclusion projects for MGM, or has supported diversity and inclusion projects for MGM National Harbor, Woodrow Wilson Bridge, Prince George's County, Maryland Supplier Development and Diversity Division, U.S. Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Division, Federal Bureau of Investigations, and 2020 Black Farmers Cooperative. Maynard volunteers at several community organizations, including being the current president of the Fayetteville State University, D.C. alumni chapter. Though Maynard is in D.C., his heart is right here with us in North Carolina, so we welcome Maynard to be joining us virtually as soon as our tech team can get him on the screen. So, um, John will be presenting first. As John is preparing, uh, this topic is supply chain opportunities, a developer's perspective. So we are happy to hear from Dominion Energy and U.S. Wind. John. All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak. And I think um, some people have seen parts of this presentation before, but we continue to update the information as we advance our project, uh, the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Update. So. Um, I think you saw a picture in the last presentation of the two turbines out there, but uh, this is a really great experience for me to have worked on these two turbines over a decade ago. And again, it's a decade to see these types of projects to come to fruition. And I really applaud uh, the NC Towers and uh, Department of Commerce for thinking and working way ahead of time to get things in place to support the development of offshore wind. Um, uh, right now, we have under development the largest uh, utility project on the East Coast. It's uh, 
really it's built off the success that we had with those two turbines. And we actually secured this lease back in 2013. And you can say, hey, Dominion, why didn't you move forward with, you know, starting with that large project? Well, at that time, you saw several larger projects start in the Northeast and not be successful. And we stepped back and said, what's the prudent course of action here? And, and we took a look at a couple of key things. Number one, no one had been through the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management approval process, right? Offshore wind was new. It, it's been a great process. This allowed us to have a lot of collaboration with them, and we shared that information with other developers and, and the whole industry. So that, that was great for us to start with two turbines and collaborate with the Commonwealth of Virginia, who actually holds the area as a research lease, not a commercial lease that's available that's out there. Um, second thing, no supply chain infrastructure, support infrastructure, Jones Act compliant vessels capable of supporting offshore wind. And then lastly, we knew turbines were moving from the 6 megawatt size to the 12 to 15 megawatt class turbines that we have and that we'll deploy on this project. So there will be 176 turbines, 14.7 megawatts each, for just shy of 2,600 megawatts. And you say, okay, that's, that will be our largest generation asset when you think about it uh, for Dominion Energy that we have. And uh, I'll comment on the number of homes there. That number of homes, the significance with that is that is approximately allows us to power 25% of our residential load that we serve in Virginia as Dominion Energy Virginia and Northeast North Carolina. So pretty significant generation resource for us. Uh, as you look at it. I'll talk a little bit more about schedule as we, we go ahead here. Uh, I'm really going to highlight, um, as this, I will ask a quick question. How many people here know what we paid for our lease back in 2013? For what we, outside of you, Ashley. You can <laughs> yeah. Yes. About $900,000. $1.7 million. Similar size lease that just went in the New York bite went for 1.1 billion. People thought we were crazy to spend 1.7 million dollars in 2013 on offshore wind. I mean, people thought we had lost our mind. So it just goes to show you that was actually a great investment for us. But real quick, uh, in December we got our draft environmental impact statement. I obviously go through the public comment period. Uh, we expect in January of next year to get the record of decision that will allow us to move forward and start construction. Um, we'll see some activities onshore before then. I'll get into this a little more detail and then the offshore with actually uh, completing construction at, at the end of 2026 uh, construction season. Um, I'll highlight here, obviously, uh, we use Demi and Prismium or our balance of plant or everything with the, on the offshore section, right, everything with the exception of the turbine erection. So, uh, wind turbines, Siemens Gamesa, 14.7 megawatt, monopiles or EEW, uh, transition pieces, uh, the yellow part that everyone's very familiar with about the waterline, uh, black, and then Black and Simcoe are doing the offshore substations. In fact, an announcement came out, what would have been for us, um, early this morning uh, for Denmark to serve as the manufacturing location for uh, our offshore substations. And then, as I mentioned, Deme, as far as we go with the balance of the project. Uh, right now, we're in the process of bidding uh, the onshore. So we'll have onshore uh, substation and line construction. I'll cover that in a little bit more detail here. Oh. Uh, a little more on key construction. Right now, I mean, you understand that uh, Duke and Total are beginning to work on what their plans are going to be to do all their environmental analysis. Uh, we've certainly gone through that process where we are, but uh, big activity right now is UXO identification. So we've done our UXO, that's unexploded ordinances, and if you think in particular off the coast of Norfolk with the Navy from World War II to current training, um, there are some certain metal objects that appear to be out there on the bottom of the sea and covered up by sand and mud over the years. 
So we've gone, for, gone through that, identified the magnetic anomalies. We're in the process of identifying whether it is actually a UXO or if it's something else that just happens to be at the bottom of the sea. So that process is underway now. Uh, we're right now finishing up the design for our operations center uh, that will be located at Lambert's Point. I'll talk about that a little more. Our first monopow will be delivered to Portsmouth Marine Terminal in October, so that will mark the first real landfall of equipment for sea valve. And of course, what we'll do there is we will have a pretty large inventory ready to go and just keep a replenishment as adjusting time as we move forward with the construction. Um, expect to put that first monopile uh, in, in May of 24, as soon as uh, we, we clear the right well migration center. Uh, so as soon as we have light enough to do that, you will see that piling going into, uh, into the seafloor. We'll go through uh, the construction season, um, stand down for noise making activities, come back, repeat the cycle next year. So the first year we'll put in one substation and half of the monopiles and TPs, transition pieces. Come back the next year in 25, finish foundation transition pieces, erect about half of the turbines. And then we'll come back and finish turbine erection and all the other interconnection activities as we move forward to be ready in 2026. So uh, that's really the highlights and steps that you see moving forward for us. All right, a uh, little bit. Um, this is great information on the ports and uh, what it takes here. Um, when those monopiles come in, keep in mind there are a couple of thousand tons. And to give you an idea, that blue arrow is pointing towards two small dots. Those are people. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude of just the monopiles. Uh, and you see the transition piece here in the middle photo being set on top. Uh, they'll come in, be stood up. Both uh, the monopiles and the transition pieces do have some equipment in them. So that will all you know, be tested and uh, adjusted from shipments to make ready for pre-staging. Uh, to go out. Then you have the wind turbine that sits there. Uh, talked about the magnitude of, of the turbines. And I've been out there 27 times, so I'm kind of used to seeing them doing tours. But uh, the blades on the offshore wind turbines, 108 meters long to convert that into something you easily recognize here from the States. A football field, goalpost to goalpost. That's how long the blades are. We had somebody that said, oh, you should take a blade around and let students from all the different schools <laughs> sign it. And it's like, do you understand what you're talking about? That's just not even possible. So uh, we have some other, uh, other options that we're going to pursue with that. Uh, the substations will have three of them, roughly a third of uh, the turbines serving each one. The heaviest lift for us is that top side on uh, the offshore substation. It's about 4,000 tons. So it's a, a beast of a piece of equipment. Uh, and it's just like any other 230 uh, volt, kV volt, kilovolt uh, substation that you would see. It's just four stories tall and enclosed because it'll be in a maritime environment. And you go to work out there, you get to take a helicopter ride. It's going to be high enough above the sea that you won't be climbing and trying to carry your gear, unlike when you work on the turbines. And then, of course, cables. We've got inner array cables, a little less than 300 miles of cables. They're about eight inches in in diameter, a little less than eight, and then nine 230 kV export cables, and they're a little over 11 inches, and uh, what is that, a little over 400 miles that we'll have of those uh, to come ashore. So that gives you an idea for the components and the staging. Right now, the only facility in the U.S. I'm aware of that's doing the offshore substations is Kiwit down in the Gulf Coast. has. Um, been successful in receiving a bid. I think most of the rest of them are being serviced right now from Europe. Uh, a little bit about the importance, and I came in and caught the last uh, Jennifer's presentation on uh, transmission interconnection. And this is one of the biggest challenges facing the industry, right? Because uh, getting to your load pockets is critical. And so we were uh, pretty fortunate in a couple of situations we had. We started out with 13 routes. We had a grass tops advisory committee. Um, we, we asked questions, found out where we should avoid areas, and it was a very diverse committee. 
uh, with representatives from uh, a number of different groups uh, that, that met with us twice a month uh, for, for about 14 months as we went through this, ended up with what we recommended as uh, the primary route, and that primary route was approved by the Virginia State Corporation Commission, which is our public utility commission in Virginia. Um, what made this really fortunate for us is we already had a transmission corridor that ran that way, so uh, we were able to utilize a lot of that. And there was a, pro pro a road project to connect Chesapeake to Virginia Beach that was never built, but both cities had all the easements. So we were able to go along and utilize those easements in working with the cities. So that allowed us the, the fortune of, of having existing infrastructure or planned infrastructure uh, easements. So we have a little less than a mile of, I'll call it virgin right away that we're working with and about 30 some uh, property owners on that. So very fortunate. Uh, what's gonna happen is we'll, we'll come ashore at the state military reservation. If you're familiar with the area, you may know that as Camp Pendleton uh, in Virginia Beach. We will go underground over to Naval, Naval Air Station Oceana. Have to go underground because of restrictions, because of aircraft. Then we'll come above ground and travel about 14 miles over to Chesapeake substation. So two key, I'll say, substation type things are the switching station where we come from underground to overhead, right? We'll be on Navy property. Uh, it will, unfortunately, we, well, fortunately for them, we get to build them a new golf cart shed, a little pro shop uh, for the base. Uh, we'll locate there. And then at Fentress, you can see we're basically doubling the substation. Uh, very interesting aspect about Fentress, that's kind of an auxiliary training landing station for the Navy. And, uh, you know, when we went out and met with each one of the community members and talked about noise and noise at the, the fence line, they're like, we won't ever hear the noise because of the Navy aircraft doing their training. So, very unique environment that we found ourselves in there. Um, so a little bit about when you come ashore here, and I know that uh, as, as you look at that, that's always going to be a concern. So there'll be these nine cables coming in, and we'll use a large pipe or conduit, and you can see they get bundled and pulled in through that. About a half mile offshore, you dig a vault, you use the, uh, put the conduit in place, and it comes up behind the beach, right? So you don't disturb the near shore environment. So this gives you an idea, it's a spread, they all come in. We'll, we'll actually uh, have to also use HDD to go under two lakes at State Military Reservation as well. So uh, uh, be some direct barrier as well as that. But this is uh, how you see the approaches come in and the getaways once you get on shore. Uh, I talked about um, the fortune of having existing right-of-ways. So in this existing right-of-way, we had the old lattice structures um, for, for transmission line. One had a circuit on it, the other, other side was idle. And what we found in working with uh, both NERC and PJM is that we could put up two monopoles and get that existing circuit plus the three circuits, if you think of it as circuit from each substation, to use to get overhead and not have to widen our right-of-way. So that was a great benefit. And that in a very congested area, right of ways running through neighborhoods and backyards, we actually did not have to secure any new right of way. Um, so I'll shift a little bit now to kind of the economic development piece and, and what we've been doing. We actually began doing meetings back in December of 2020, where our initial meetings with schools and workforce councils, as well as businesses and working with economic development agencies. So I myself have participated in about 130 uh, economic development or uh, diverse business organization meetings since that time, and about 135 meetings with basically different educational institutions or either uh, minority serving institutions in neighborhoods uh, to talk about offshore winds. So we've been well down the road. We continue to refine that and advance it as we get more information about the scopes of work that our prime vendors will use and what jobs come with that. So uh, we started with uh, our, our events, as I said, in 2020. Uh, we just had another one. And I saw on the program that there's a lot of discussion 
uh, in the afternoon part about what it takes for businesses to be ready to work in offshore wind. So we found as we began doing this and issued solicitations to support the two turbine operation phase that companies understood and wanted to participate but they hadn't done things like gotten maritime insurance, they didn't understand maritime law, didn't understand GWO training despite the fact that we've had numerous meetings with uh, various groups on that over the year and the other thing is ISO training. Uh, many of the companies in our area are very oriented towards a mill spec because of the Navy but they're going to need ISO certification uh, if they're going to move forward and step into uh, the <coughs> offshore wind supply chain. And then of course we had one on financing so we had uh, looking at federal financing, state financing and then commercial lending uh, for them. So it's very important as you work to help adjacent industries make that transition that you work really hard to understand the different types of law that could apply and uh, what they may need to do as they go forward. You know, we've, uh, we've been off to a great start, uh, got some large activities, uh, working primarily on the uh, Port of uh, Virginia's Portsmouth Marine Terminal. This will be our marshaling area here, 72 acres. That's where the equipment will be pre-staged and tested and prepared for installation. Siemens Gamesa has the blade finishing facility uh, identified there, so um, that's directly adjacent to us, so then blades will just come right down a path here and go over. Uh, so that activity is underway right now. If you drive across uh, and, and go down the highway there after the monitor to Merrimack, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of work. Um, very fortunate that the foundations that went in to increase the weight bearing capacity uh, were were manufactured locally, so that was a, a great win for the project, pretty significant. About a $250 million investment. Uh, Siemens Gamesa facility would be greater than $200 million. Uh, just across the river, Lambert's Point uh, is under development called Fairwinds. Uh, a lot of economic development activity looking at that site right now, as well as that's where our operations base will be housed. Uh, so that'll have our Maritime Coordination Center our control room, warehouse, and various administrative staff. And then one of the things that we've been happy to see and as we talk to uh, our prime vendors are they're looking for more and more small companies to come to the area because it helps create that center of excellence. So bring that from Europe, bring it over here and help us get moving, right? So we've seen that. There are about eight others that will be announced here soon between them the regional area down there with getting companies to come in to, uh, to support it. Our operations center, so to, to give you an idea, that's really just going to be a 30,000 square foot building. But the key thing is having the, the key side there for vessels to come up. We'll have two CTVs, crew transfer vessels. Those are the Ubers of the system, moving people and goods back and forth. Uh, we'll have the floating Holiday Inn. That's the service operations vessel in the middle. So that'll take about 30 or so offshore wind technicians out at a time. And then the crew for the vessel has a warehouse. Each one has birthing, they have, each one has their own birthing room. And uh, I do point out that's B-E-R-T-H, not B-I-R-T-H. Um, so they'll have their own room, a little couch area, and a shower and toilet facilities. Then there's uh, the galley. Uh, workout room, gym, and then an entertainment center. So right now this vessel for us is being fabricated in Wisconsin uh, with Siemens Gamesa. So since we didn't know that much about offshore wind technicians and O&M, we're learning a lot with our two turbines. Uh, the first uh, period with our uh, service agreement that we have with uh, Siemens, half the technicians will be Dominion and half will be experienced Siemens technician and we'll make that transition of uh, technology and knowledge and intellectual capabilities over uh, as we go forward. And then, of course, Charybdis, uh, built by Dominion Energy Virginia's uh, parent company. Uh, it's under construction down in uh, Brownsville, Texas, um, uh, with regards to uh, being able to install the wind turbines. Uh, you mentioned um, air draft restrictions. and. You know, Moorhead's very fortunate in Radio Island that there's no air draft restrictions. Most ports have that. When you get to these larger turbines, 
you're talking about a 400 foot tower standing erect in the freeboard to the water. There's not a lot of places that make great ports for that. So it's pretty key to be able to, uh, to do that and get that in and out as you go forward. But uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the vessel completed and getting out and installing wind turbines. Um, you know, and very similar to the objectives in North Carolina is how do you build that hub and take advantage of the assets you have and optimize what you can do to support um, the wind industry. So again, that, that no draft restriction, pretty quick speed straight out to the mouth of the Chesapeake and available economic development uh, sites uh, are key things as you look at here. Um, I think I already saw this in Jennifer's presentation, so I'm not going to spend any time on that, um, just out of uh, respect for time for the team here. And then I'll just, I'll just stop and uh, share one if there are any questions. Yes, here's one right here. Thanks, John. Good presentation. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, um, who and how are blades for large? Who, who and how are large turbine blades carried? If they're three football fields long. No, uh, a football field long. A football field. So, sorry, go post to go post. Nope, sorry. They're all manufactured keyside, right? Because you can't transport them otherwise. So you're going to okay. see them all built along the coast. They'll be picked up and loaded onto a vessel initially until there's full manufacturing here in the States, brought over and unloaded in what they call it, they call it a green blade, and the reason is the fiberglass is green, that the resin they use for offshore wind turbines. And then they're loaded and they're, I don't know any other way to say it, it's like a little U-shaped um, cart or buggy that's motorized. So you have one at, towards the front third and one towards the rear third of the blade, and then they're just moved around the site with those. Got it. Thanks. And then the second question was, um, how did the supplier diversity outreach sessions go? Have you seen any evidence of success yet? So, you know, when we look at it and look at right now the stage that we are in, most of our manufacturing, because we're so early in the process, keep in mind we bid our contracts out, and had our contracts in 2020 and had them all awarded in 2021, most of our manufacturing has taken place in Europe. So what we're seeing is working with our vendors for that tier two and tier three scopes is they get ready to mobilize at the beginning of next year and meeting with them. So our diverse spin right now is not that high because there's actually not that much manufacturing or whatever activity taking place today. So it more so comes in the line of services and those types of things with us. But we have had great engagement um, working with urban leagues, working with uh, uh, various diverse chambers of commerce, uh, and we also have a commitment to support project labor agreements on our project. And one of the things as we began working with the building trades is they're not particularly diverse, right? Let's be honest, most of the people in building trades look like me. And most of them are probably getting close to my age nowadays, right? So there's a whole new workforce coming in. And we were very concerned about how we're going to reach our objectives. So we began working with the IBEW since we have IBEW represented employees at Dominion and found some really great programs up in Columbus that they had partnered together to bring young men and women who were interested in electrical work on some metropolitan projects there. And we had them begin to work with uh, the Urban League in Hampton Roads area uh, and partner as they go about starting to look at developing the workforce and, and the outreach and what they needed to do in addition to the technical training, but the soft skill training as well. Dana. John, thank you for this presentation. It's nice to see this presentation not uh, on rolling and pitching in the <laughs> vessel like the last time. Um, quick question, what can we do to resource you as you have conversations with these vendors looking to grow to look to North Carolina to provide some of those manufacturing resources? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is, is as you look, and this is something I encourage North Carolina to really look at, you know, some of the states to our north have put billions and billions in to get like nacelle manufacturing and that kind of thing. So what you've got to really do is understand what the components are for that. 
and get to them. For us right now, it's blade finishing. So what does that come down to? Coatings and basically then a final gel coat, just like on a boat. They're fiberglass, right? So that's the primary thing right now. I think you're going to see because of what the northern states have done, New Jersey, um, New York, and Mass, have, the investments that their states have made, it's really trying to identify and work with, say, Siemens and GE to understand what those components are and get those companies out there and get introduced to their supply chain as they do it. Because we all know that unless you've got a really great cost or performance of value after that initial selection is made for who you're sourcing with, you're going to have a heck of a tough time displacing somebody, right? So now's the time to begin that for, for North Carolina across the board. Any other questions for John? John, thank you for that uh, very informative presentation. Uh, lots of good information in there. And again, this presentation will be available to uh, anyone who's interested on our website. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as we get ready for me to submit, I want to emphasize uh, what you heard John say, that the majority of their suppliers are European because we don't have the market developed here, uh, the supply chain developed here to support this, which is why this conversation is so important, uh, how we can help our businesses prepare and pivot and transition to support this industry. So uh, let's keep that in mind as we listen to this additional presentation and all the other information and, and as we work in our subcommittees on how we can support our North Carolina businesses and being becoming primary suppliers for some of these um, projects that are already underway. And with that, I'd like to welcome Maynard Smith, who's joining us virtually. Maynard, thank you. Maynard is with U.S. Wind, and I'll turn it over to you, Maynard. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm waiting for the presentation to load. Before that loads, <coughs> tell a little bit about who I am. My name is Maynard Smith. I am the U.S. Wind. Maryland Business Engagement Manager. I want to thank the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce, North Carolina Tower Sports, for having me present uh, what we're doing in Maryland. Uh, Nicole and uh, as well, you guys have been outstanding, staying in contact with me, and uh, it's an honor to actually talk to you guys today. I will tell you a little bit about me I, and about my background. One, um, I grew up in a little town called Martinsville, Virginia which is on the coast of Virginia, so the Millennium Project is really important because I, I listened to John. And then uh, I, I actually attended Fayetteville State, the number one HBCU in North Carolina, Fayetteville State University. <laughs> so I'm really attracted to what's going on in North Carolina. And of course, I've lived in the, uh, the DMV now since the mid-80s, so I sort of cover all three states, and it's just great to hear what we're doing all show when. So, let me begin my presentation. Next slide. So uh, who is U.S. Wind? Uh, U.S. Wind is a company that has uh, obtained a lease off the coast of uh, Maryland. I don't know if you've driven to uh, come out to Ocean City, Maryland. But we were able to acquire 80,000 acres in between 15 and 22 miles outside of the coast of Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, our contract currently right now has us developing over 1,100 megawatts of power. And that's based on two projects, a marble project, a momentum wind project. We have a world-class development team. Our team really consists of um, some outstanding individuals from Europe and also the United States. Our CEO, Jeff Grabowski, built the first offshore wind project off the coast of Rhode Island, and that was called Deepwater, Deepwater Wind. Um, we are backed by a leading global investment firm, uh, U.S. Wind is a U.S. firm, uh, but we actually are owned by Toto Group and Apollo Group Management, which is a broker's firm out of New York. Next slide. By the way, I know that I stand between you guys and left, so I'm trying to get these slides. Okay? All right, so um, this slide talks about U.S. Wind's development, where we're, where we're at in, in Maryland. So as you can see on the right corner, you see Morrowind. That is our offshore wind project, which will have about 22 wind turbines. We complete that by the second half of this decade. 
the, this, the next one is called Minter Wind, which will take about 55 wind turbines. So combined together, we'll have about 76 wind turbines in ocean, outside the coast of Ocean City, Maryland, which can produce about 1,100 megawatts of power. But we also, just to be clear, our governor uh, just uh, extended offshore wind in Maryland. So he's now saying that we could, if, if we are successful with bidding, we may get to build out our entire acreage, which uh, out of the 80,000 acres, we can produce about 1,800 megawatts of power. So we'll see how that moves this, this year. Next, next slide. Scale of offshore wind. So just, I, I've heard John, I've heard Dana. Just want to let you guys know, this is what, um, if you compare it to the turbine itself, you look at the Statue of Liberty, it's about 305 feet. If our state knows about 1,400 uh, uh, feet. Aqua Tower is a little bit 1,000 feet. The average offshore wind turbine is about 466 feet. And the tallest U.S. wind turbine right now is about 574 feet. And we're looking at the GE turbine which should be about 852 feet. And currently in Rhode Island, the offshore wind um, turbine is about 590 feet. Next slide. Here's where it's getting excited. So the Biden administration said they have a goal of deploying 30,000 megawatts of power by 2030. Currently, there are only two projects in the United States. The one that uh, John just mentioned, which is offshore wind, which has 12 megawatts of power, and the Block Island wind farm, which has 30 megawatts of power. There are currently 15 uh, projects uh, throughout the United States that are in the permitting phase. And of course, uh, the only one that's gotten full approval is the Vineyard Project out of Massachusetts. Uh, and we started our project. Maryland project back in 2013. So it's been, I think David said that you guys are looking at 2035. It's about a 10 year project. So it, it's a long process we're permitting. Next slide. All right, so I know David said that you know, again, you said 2035. I want to go through this slide really well so everybody understands where we are in Maryland. So back in 2013, 2014, there was an RFI calls so that we're looking at lease process. So we obtained our lease back in that time period, and then we had to go through what's called the, uh, we actually did the, I can't see that slide. Let me get to be 60, yeah, put on the glasses. So um, again, our flight back in 2030 was called, and then we had the, uh, the area identifications and identified the area in the Atlantic Ocean that, the, uh, that we'd be able to bid on the contract. Then there was a public leasing notice, which took about a year and a half to go through the public leasing. And that went through NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Act, for environmental review. So again, this is the entire 10 year cycle. Then a lease was granted. And there was an option. And again, we did the option back in 2014. And then there was a pre-serving meeting plan. And then there was what's called, we had to submit a setback, which is uh, a site assessment plan. And we took another year. And then we had to go through BOA, which reviews and approves all the steps. And then a five-year cycle of site assessment is in surveys. And we go through that process. And then we had to submit what's called our COP, which is our construction operation by the ball, which we did that 2017 and also re again in 2019. BOA, um, again, completes the COP. And then we're now in where we are now, where you see US Square, which is BOA is reviewing uh, our environmental um, technical services. And that takes about two more years. So we're looking at full. Um, approval by BOEM, that again, BOEM is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, by 2024. And then as we move into BOEM approvals, like COMP, then we do restoration, and we're looking at hopefully by 2026, 2027 for installation. So it is a long process. Again, I do understand what Dana was talking about in terms of the tenure cycle. 
This is not a short-term project. This is a long-term project to try to get the permitting for it. It's really difficult. But we're moving to the next slide, and it looks good for us. Next slide. All right, I think um, that next thing about uh, the marshaling facility. So this is what the Maryland site would look like. Um, if you're familiar with the old Bethlehem Steel Yard, which is on the coast of, uh, um, right outside of Baltimore in Baltimore County. So this is what our marshaling facility will look like. Um, again, now it's called Trade for Atlantic, but it's a beautiful site. And we'll, we'll hope to be able to produce about 100 monopiles per year. Um, and also we'll be able to produce about 100 transitional pieces. So if you look at this line, you see those little yellow and white little rolls, that would be a monopile. In front of that, you'll see the little transitional pieces, which are two structures made out of high-grade offshore wood steel. And the monopiles are the end, I think we all know what they are, but they're driven to the seabed of the ocean to actually support the, uh, the turbines. And before, in front of those little yellow tubes, yellow white tubes, you'll see the facility, and you see a little piece of uh, like brown right there. It's perfect, yeah. So that's a little, we're going to talk about that in the next slide. It's that metal, steel metal that's going through there and it comes out and produces a monopile. The goal for US-1 is that our spiral sport steel will be able to produce and help with the supply chain what produces about 100 monopiles per year. And that's really important for us. And that will uh, lead to about 500 permanent logistic jobs at this facility. And this facility will serve the entire US offshore wind work. Next slide. All right, so this is what see, this is what it will look like inside. And I know that we, I've seen that on the slides, but the really be so if you look to the top left, you'll see that the, again the metal is coming in from overseas, but it'll come in and look at cheats, as you can see, and then we'll bend it, and then it'll eventually look like the on, on the right hand side, whether it be in one little, one little spool, and then you see on the left corner what it actually looks like inside. It's it's huge, it's just Tremendously big. And then on the right hand side, the one below, that's the finished touches of the model part. So it's a lot of work to make sure that we build those model parts accurately. Next slide. So I think we want to talk about um, uh, working with the unions. In Maryland, we are, our gentleman in the middle of the slide, which is Jim Strong, he calls me every week to make sure that you know, we're supporting and I'm doing what I have to do to get out to the public. So this is what we're showing the Maryland as steel is back. And we're working with the Baltimore DC Metro Bill and Trade Council. Of course, at IBEW, I think, and John mentioned that, the electrical company, the electrical unions, and of course the steel unions. We, this will be a, a union-driven project. We do have MOUs in place now with all of the unions, and we're working towards PLAs, and that is coming. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the um, organizations that we're working with here in Maryland uh, in terms of reaching out to diverse communities. Uh, and again, our goal on this project is a 15% MDE, Maryland Business Enterprise Participation, and that is at a minimum. So we reached out to the Maryland uh, uh, Minority Maryland Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Pan Asian American Chamber of Commerce, the Maryland Metropolitan, the Maryland Washington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Maryland Hispanic Chamber, NAACP, the Capital Regional Arts by Development Council, uh, Greater Baltimore Committee. Um, we have a host of diverse organizations in the state of Maryland, and we've had virtually every one of them over the last couple of years. And then all our, our partners trying to build this project. Next slide. So, over the last two years that I've been on this project, a lot of small businesses, particularly the ones in Maryland and Delaware, because we're, our, our substation will be in Delaware. We're going to be coming on board. I mean, so the cables will flow out of the ocean and they'll land in, in Delaware. So we have to make sure that everyone's aware of the trades that we're going to be doing, because even as we build out uh, Spurs Point Steel, which is our fabrication facility, there are things that small businesses and companies really need to understand. And this is a list that we, we say that we're going to need for services. We're going to need asbestos and lead paint. We need blasting specialists, building rehab, bulldozers. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all this because I'll leave these slides with you guys. 
But all these tasks and trades and things that we're going to need over the course of as we build out our project in the second half of this decade. And that's forklift operators, fuel. So it's a host of things we're really looking for for small businesses to work with. Um, and, you know, we're, we're heavily involved with um, all the four HBCUs that are in the state of Maryland. We've been reaching out to uh, all the um, community colleges. We've uh, looking at University of Maryland, John Hopkins, we've got relationships with all of them. So, but again, all of them are where these are the types of smaller trends that can, that can lead into jobs on our project. Next slide. And that's really it. You know, I know you guys before, we didn't have much, but our project is moving forward. Um, we are, again, looking very hard at small businesses in the state of Maryland. We hope to have our, our wind blades turning to the middle Atlantic Ocean by the second half of this decade, between 2026 and 2028. And we are, of course, monitoring what's happening in North Carolina and in Virginia. I think we are all working towards trying to make sure we build out a strong supply chain. And whatever we can do, whatever I can do, to support um, both Virginia and Maryland, because those are my home states, I'm all for that. So that's my slides. Any questions? Thank you, Maynard. Any questions for Maynard? Okay. Yes, Steve Kaplan. Hi, Maynard. And John, you may want to respond to this question. You're still here as well. There you are back there. But I was just curious, is there particular companies or particular components or even services that you guys are specifically targeting that you'd like to attract to the region? You know, are there, I mean, not necessarily the company name, but at least <coughs> types of companies uh, that, you know, those of us that are out talking with folks can always be, you know, kind of focused on as, you know, folks that we'd like to see come to the region first. You know, for us, for, for you as well, it's more so uh, welding companies. So we're really trying to find as many welding companies as we can. Uh, and we're looking at all kind of trading companies as well, because we are, we, because of, the, of what Biden's put out, President Biden's put out, we train dollars. We're looking for working with those types of companies that can help us do a lot of training. And I, I think I heard John talk about ISO training. Yes, we're going to do a lot of ISO training. And so those are the types of firms right now, just on the ground, on the ground level, that we're trying to find. Yeah, when, uh, again, John Larson here. As you look uh, right now with the blade finishing facility, obviously a natural extension potentially for blade manufacturing would make sense. Uh, so, you know, currently today the industry's coatings, those types of things, instrumentation that goes into blades um, are, are key areas. There's some other economic development activities that I probably shouldn't be talking about with uh, Lambert's Point but uh, different uh, parts of the supply chain and large components that are, that are high in that Lambert's part area that would require a pretty extensive uh, tier two and tier three network as you go forward. So, uh, you know, really working and oriented and assessing the reason why it's there and helping businesses understand how to make that transition from their adjacent industry if they're not directly supporting it now. Because so many of the, the, the needs that are there and, uh, you know, they have the capability to do it. It's getting the certifications and the training to do it in offshore wind. So. Absolutely. Thanks. Other questions? And let's keep in mind that it said that more than 8,000 component parts go into making up a turbine. So that's a lot of opportunity for a lot of different businesses. So we do have our work cut out for us. Thank you, Maynard. Thank you, John. We appreciate you spending this time with us and sharing this, uh, your developer's perspective and the opportunities that are out there. Implements technology-related economic <coughs> development policy and resource allocations. Supervises the staff of the North Carolina Board of Science, Technology, and Innovation and directs and oversees the administration of grant programs <coughs> to support technology development and commercialization and oversees strategic initiatives. Joining John as co-moderator is Mark Poole. He's been with the North Carolina Department of Commerce for 14 years and currently serves as the Director of Commerce Finance Center. He manages a variety of the department's grant programs and discretionary incentives, including the Job Development Investment Grant, 
the film grant program, the industrial development fund, and other programs that support activities throughout the motorsports and esports industries. Prior to his work at Commerce, Mark spent 15 years in Washington, D.C., and three years in Chicago working a variety of, in a variety of capacities that spanned venture capital, international nonprofits, corporate communications, and the federal government. Joining them, our panelists today are Kevin Dick, President and Chief Executive Officer of Carolina Small Business Development Fund. Under the first year of his leadership, the organization responded quickly and aggressively to the needs of small businesses by providing financial assistance to over 1,000 or 1,100 small businesses throughout the state and deploying over 17 million in loan and grant funds. During that period, his organization also assisted over 200 businesses with technical assistance and coaching. Emily Felt, the Department of Energy Loan Program Officer, Emily is a senior consultant to the U.S. Department of Energy's Loan Program Office. She conducts outreach and business development to finance technologies and infrastructure projects that enable the energy transition with a loan quote. Reading too fast for myself. You're doing a great job. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Trying to keep great. us on time. <laughs> so she conducts outreach and business development to finance technologies and infrastructure projects that enable the energy transition with a focus on offshore wind deployment. Prior to this role, she held multiple leadership positions at Duke Energy, including Director of Federal Policy, Director of Environmental Policy, and Director of Corporate Strategy. Also joining us, Harrison Moskowitz is Executive Director, America's Head of Export and Agency Finance at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Harrison heads a team responsible for structuring and executing structured export credit and development multilateral finance loans for America-based clients of J.P. Morgan and manages global programs with America's based official agencies. His area of focus includes corporate and sovereign finance, project finance, asset-based financing, and trade finance. Also joining us, Jim Weiss is founder and co-director of North Carolina Clean Energy Fund, a nonprofit green bank that utilizes public and private capital to capitalize, to catalyze investments in clean and efficient energy and transportation projects in the state with a focus on traditionally underserved communities. She was most recently the senior advisor for climate change policy at the North Carolina Department of Transportation, where she coordinated climate-related transportation activities across the NCDOT, including the development of the state's first clean transportation plan. And you'll be able to read everyone's full bios on our website. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Marquita. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it and say that uh, as you all know, the title of this panel is Supply Chain Financing for Offshore Wind Development. And when we say for offshore wind development, we mean everything associated with offshore wind development. So this is going to be very comprehensive. Of the four panelists we have, I would say that none of them is an expert in the entire package, but the collection, you put them all together, we have a good range of expertise across the various components. I'm not sure if there's anyone in the world that's an expert on the entire um, package of, of financing that's needed. But I'm going to break that down into two categories. I would say that we're talking about, number one, financing for offshore wind project development. And by that, what I mean is what you've seen a lot of today, and that is kind of, we call it steel in the water, basically. the, the the big structures going into the water, and those are led by tier one developers. And there's a whole round of and stage and type of financing that's needed for that. That's one dimension of this. The other dimension is financing for offshore wind manufacturing facilities and related infrastructure, such as ports, transmission, and so forth. And so. If you add up the amount of financing that's needed for all those different elements, it is billions of dollars for, for each offshore wind um, 
wind energy area. And what's interesting and challenging about this is that has never been done in the U.S. You know, offshore wind has been an industry in Europe for 30 years, but it took a long time for that to develop, and it took a long time for the ecosystems of financing to develop. And a lot of finance is um, not so much certainty, but predictability. And if you lack predictability, or if funders lack predictability, that's going to make it them unwilling or less willing to finance. And so because this is a new industry, and there is some uncertainty and some unpredictability, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge. And you'll see in a later slide that I'll show for a committee update why it's a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. And hopefully we can learn some from the way they've done it in Europe. Um, their structures are different, but um, we still can learn some lessons from Europe. So even though Marquita gave some great introductions <laughs> to the panelists, we're going to allow them, each one of them, five to ten minutes to introduce themselves a little bit more, a little more deeply. Tell us a little bit about their background and training as it relates to um, the panel. A little bit about their organizations and their experience with offshore wind energy in general. Um, not just the financing aspect, but just offshore wind in general. And it's quite possible that some of these panelists don't have a lot of experience with offshore wind. And that's not unusual either because, again, it's a new industry um, in the U.S. But, but together, I think we're going to get a rich understanding of what the opportunities are and the ways are to um, finance the whole experience with respect to offshore wind. So um, some of the panelists are going to have a presentation for their intro and some are not. One of the panelists, Emily Felt, um, is not here in person, but she does have a presentation, and so we're going to start with that, and then we'll um, go to the next three panelists. So, Emily, I will be advancing your slides. Can you hear me? And can we hear you? Alan? Sorry. see your presentation. Um, we cannot see you, so we'll, can you see your presentation on your end? I can see Emily, uh, and Emily, can you speak to make sure we can hear you? Emily, it sounds like you, I mean, it seems like you're muted. Can you hear me now? I hear you now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> oh, that's great. Um, I work for the U.S. Department of Energy right now um, in the Loan Programs Office. Um, our job is to deploy... I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback here. Are you? Yeah. No, no feedback here. You sound good. All right. Is this better? Can you see me now? Yes. Okay. Um, the Loan Programs Office was established about 15 years ago um, to deploy capital uh, to accelerate certain technologies, energy technologies, um, introduction into uh, the commercial space. Um, we got a massive infusion of responsibility uh, recently with the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. At the Loan Programs Office, we're about 200 people. Um, we are led by uh, Jigger Shaw, who's somewhat of a rock star in the solar industry. Um, I remember my days at Duke Energy back in 2010. Um, Jigger's company, uh, Sun Edison, actually built the largest solar farm on the East Coast in Davidson County, North Carolina. Now, it was 16 megawatts, and it was the largest on the East Coast for about five minutes. 
Um, and then, as you all know, um, solar farms got larger and larger and larger. Um, and Jigger is, uh, is, uh, is very focused on offshore wind um, because it is one of our nation's priorities at this point, the administration's priorities, 30 by 30, uh, 30 gigawatts by 2030. And um, my job at LPO is 100% offshore wind. If you would advance the slide, please, please. Are you able to advance yes. your slide? Yes, I'm advancing. Thanks. Sorry about that. Cool. So in the 15 years that we've been around, um, we've made about $36 billion in loans. And these loans are at um, some, usually somewhere around the U.S. Treasury rate. Um, some of the loans have adders to them, which creates them or 37.5 basis points and things like that, or risk premium. But the idea is to get um, U.S. government capital out to these industries because they are national priorities. Um, so in the past, we've done $36.5 billion um, in loans out the door. And if you look at the next slide, this gives you an idea of our pipeline. So to date, we have applications for $124 billion, that's with E, um, dollars in loans. And this is anywhere from uh, virtual power plants, as you can see in the very, very middle, biofuels, uh, advanced nuclear, which I know is a big part of for Duke Energy. Um, and my job is to make sure that the offshore wind square grows very large here. I've been at Geary for four months now, so um, I'm, I'm just getting my sea legs. We lend to developers of projects as well as to the supply chain. So the in inflation reduction recently passed and gives us the ability to lend um, very cheap debt to uh, tier one suppliers of um, model piles, of blades, precursor materials. So if somebody is building a steel mill, um, that they will then uh, uh, sell the steel to someone who's making those monopiles. We could um, send in that um, manufacturing facility, as well as vessels. Um, the U.S. government has several programs for maritime support of offshore wind. We are one of them. And um, as you all know, uh, vessels are a big part of the supply chain here. If you wouldn't mind advancing the slide. And this is what I've been uh, talking about. Um, we're interested in financing um, uh, the production of high voltage DC lines. Um, we can finance the development of uh, uh, um, inverter stations, of um, offshore wind substations, of the offshore wind um, project itself. And as you all know, we're talking um, five to ten billion dollars for each facility, right? On last I counted, there were 22 offshore wind facilities being developed on the East Coast. We've got two who are cleared for construction by BOA, um, and the rest are in some stage of uh, uh, completing their environment reviews. Um, and we are very interested in financing as many of these as possible. I shared with you a number um, at the very beginning of the slide. That was 6.5 billion, and that's loans that DOE has made to the clean energy sector. I shared another um, another number. I think it was 135 or 124 billion or something like that. Those are the applications we received um, from folks who are developing very large scale projects. And if we finance, uh, let's say, uh, 10 of the 22 wind farms that are being built in the United, or on the East Coast, uh, between now and 2032, um, that would be about $50 billion of lending uh, to offshore wind development. I emphasize this, and I'm all about loans. I know that the 
the language we speak in the energy business is often about the cost per megawatt hour. It's going to be cheaper or more expensive if I use uh, government money, government debt versus commercial debt. And it's based on conversations with folks. I still to understand that if a developer were to take uh, LPO money, um, it could move the cost of or the price of the PPA, their revenue requirement, um, between three and five dollars. You know, there's a lot of dependency in there, but for offshore wind, we know that shaving or being very efficient and optimizing in every aspect of the supply chain is really what's going to get us over the finish line in a manner that is least cost to the customers of North Carolina. And if I leave with one message from the Loan Programs Office, and that's that we want to participate and support you all in the development of the supply chain here in North Carolina. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Emily. That's a great, a great intro. We're just going to move down the line, and, and Harrison will go um, with you next and just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your organization, and what you know about offshore wind. Thank you, John, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm part of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, head of Americas of Export and Agency Finance, which is a, a group within trade uh, and working capital business uh, at the firm. And I, I think just to, to recognize the, the folks in the room, this has been a, a really impressive uh, day of, of, of learning about the, the, the impacts upstream and downstream uh, of offshore wind in North Carolina. And you know, pleased to be a part of this financing panel, uh, which I think is quite, quite salient. And I, I think just to give some kind of headline uh, comments before uh, going to further colleagues, uh, there's going to be a financing need, I think, at this, uh, at this earliest stage of, of developing this infrastructure and this ecosystem in North Carolina. We can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but there's also, you know, th there's also this kind of last mile of financing that will be required to get the projects uh, over the line once final investment decisions have been made. So I think that really um, in that uh, build up to the stage of, uh, of actually uh, going forward with the, uh, the, the project decisions, uh, there's a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, as well as you know, larger uh, U.S. or non-U.S. Uh, companies that are going to be building uh, the fabrication and, and, and the manufacturing facilities. And I think whilst at the end of the line uh, in, the, in the project finance that's put in place, there's going to be ample interest from um, you know, governmental and, and institutional parties in, uh, in financing the project. Uh, there's going to be a need both on a, on a pre-shipment uh, and a post-shipment basis uh, to get some liquidity up the supply chain where it gets a little bit uh, more difficult to, to get financing. And I think the, the theme that was covered uh, previously on, on uh, you know, diversity and inclusion in the supply chain I think is, is also a key uh, point to be recognized as you go um, you know, through the tiers of the, uh, of the supply chain. So I think in short, there's kind of a, a, a trade finance and a working capital uh, need to get, uh, to get uh, this ecosystem ramped up. Uh, and I suspect we'll go into a little bit more detail today about uh, what these projects uh, may ultimately look like in terms of capital structure uh, and in terms of uh, what uh, has been done abroad. And then the first one or two projects uh, that have been successfully financed uh, in, in the U.S., uh, taking a look at that on a comparative basis. Uh, so I'll go over to Jen uh, for the next interest. Am I next? Yes. All right. Thanks, Harrison. Uh, well, it's really great to be here. Um, I, I'm going to answer the, the last question first, John, my knowledge of offshore wind. I know very little about offshore wind, but I'm a fan, and I keep following you all around wherever you go so I can learn more about it. Um, so I'm Jen Weiss. I um, have a very diverse background, but um, just, to, just to let you know, I do have some finance jobs. I worked for 13 years in small business banking um, way, way back when, uh, before I made the transition over into the environmental policy side. And so most recently, 
Um, I've been working at the DOT with um, clean transportation, uh, but I've also worked in energy efficiency, renewable energy, decarbonization, a whole lot of other things. Um, over the last 10 years, one of the things that's become really clear to me is that um, there's a gap in financing. And it's not that funds aren't available, but sometimes the funds don't make their way to where the funds are really needed. And so as, as I was you know, learning that in, in my work, um, I started to um, learn about this thing called green banks. And uh, how many of you actually know what a green bank is? Ah, good, okay, a couple of you. Um, so, so a green bank isn't actually a bank. It is a, um, uh, it doesn't accept deposits. Um, so we're, we're generally a financial entity that will fill market gaps and leverage public capital to entice private capital into, um, into the mix. So where there's a, a gap in financing, whether it's a, a low-income household, whether it's a new technology, um, whether it's a small business that just doesn't have the credit, we'll step in and, and, and help to make the financing happen for that entity. And so back in 2020, recognizing that this was a need in North Carolina, I founded the North Carolina Clean Energy Fund, which is a nonprofit 501c3 status um, entity um, with a specific purpose of filling those gaps. And at the time when we started it in 2020, um, we were hoping there may, might be some federal legislation that would come on there to talk about a clean energy accelerator, a national green bank. Well, that came to fruition at the end of um, last year when the, um, when the Inf Inflation Reduction Act um, had 27 billion that was designated uh, as uh, kind of a, an accelerator, um, greenhouse gas um, reduction um, fund. So long story short, we decided that it was time. Um, I stepped over from DOT and uh, became co-director of the North Carolina Clean Energy Fund back in March. So I am two months old, Emily, where you're four. So um, I'm really <coughs> younger than Emily right now. Um, and what we're doing right now is just getting out and, and learning about where there are these gaps in the financing, where are things um, that aren't happening that really need to be happening and where can we fill the, the gap. We partner. We are not going to do this alone. We will partner with, with your organization. We will partner with your organization to say, what, what are you trying to do that you can't do that we might be able to offer funding or credit enhancements to support? So I think I'll stop there, but um, just to let you know that I am learning as much as um, everybody else here, and I, I just would love your ideas and your thoughts for where there are gaps in financing. Thank you, Jen. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. I'm Kevin Dick. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Carolina Small Business Development Fund. Uh, we are headquartered in Raleigh, but we work statewide throughout the state of North Carolina. We are certified as something called a Community Development Financial Institution, otherwise known as a CDFI. Um, and that's what we're certified as. And essentially what that means is we have authorization from the U.S. Department of Treasury to provide resources in so-called underserved communities. Those are the communities that have traditionally lacked access to, um, to commercial capital, um, either because of governmental regulation and or banking regulations. Um, and the industry was basically born with the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 and then empowered more by the Regal Community Development Act of 1994, which empowered the Department of Treasury uh, to certify entities like ours, but also um, provide funding. And so what we do is really based upon um, three pillars, uh, financial capital, technical assistance, or what I like to call knowledge capital, um, and then also policy and research work where we can help inform policymakers and other stakeholders in the space about the value that small businesses are providing to North Carolina's economy, um, as well as the impacts that things like worldwide pandemics and uh, hurricanes and natural disasters, can, the impacts that they can have on small businesses. Um, what I know about offshore wind, pretty much limited to what I've learned by being part of this task force, so it's been a great experience thus far. Um, but what I think, um, I hope, what I hope to do in terms of adding value to this panel and by extension the task force is really um, start to connect both our CDFI but also small businesses we serve with the opportunities that are available um, through offshore wind. Um, we don't necessarily do green financing per se, but what we do is financing to businesses that are generally zero to 20 employees 
with loans of um, most of the time, although this year we've got we've done some larger deals, but loans mostly between five thousand and three hundred and fifty thousand. Um, and we have no predefined credit score. Um, so whereas uh, we're, we're not a bank, like, like Jen said, we're not a bank either. We're not a depository institution. You can't start an account with us. But we do um, lend, and our core product is, is um, grounded in, in our revolving loan fund, which essentially means that we borrow money from mostly commercial banks or large philanthropies, some federal agencies like the SBA and the Department of Treasury, and then we relend it to small businesses at rates that I like to call now prime, but not predatory. So generally between six and 12%. Some CDFIs um, lend uh, for affordable housing development. They participate in financial literacy programs. Our focus um, and our sole focus is small businesses. Um, my background, um, I spent a little time in marketing and sales. Um, in, in the wines and spirits industry, and that was, that was my first two jobs out of college, and those were fun. But after a while, I said, eh, I don't think I'm really helping the community that much with what I'm doing, so decided to, to make a career switch, study um, urban and regional planning, and then um, sp have spent the majority of my career in local government, and then transitioned into this 501c3 nonprofit world three years ago, six weeks before the worldwide pandemic. So it's been a fun <laughs> ride um, ever since. And really happy to be part of the panel and, and learn from um, these uh, esteemed panelists. All right, that was a great introduction. Um, I just want to say that Mark and I are going to switch off on asking questions. He and I put in many hours developing the ideal set of questions. We came up with 12 questions. There's no way we're going to get through all 12. And I should say that then Jennifer added a 13th lightning round question. And so uh, we may get to that one, though, because that's a good one. But anyway, I'm, I'll start it off, but we'll just kind of go with the flow. If we make it through two questions, but we've got great answers, great discussion, that's great. If we get through all 12 and the lightning round 13th, then, then we're good, too. We'll just go with the flow. So. Um, if you have the questions, I'm actually going to skip question one, which because I think we've already addressed that to some extent. And I'm going to ask uh, each of you, really, is how do you expect, there's three parts to this question, so let me read it. How do you expect your organization to be financing offshore wind development or manufacturing in the next decade or two? And the emphasis on decade or two, because you may not actively be doing it now. You may not be doing it two years from now. But this industry is going to be decades long. And so if you have a crystal ball and have a sense of how you might do it in the future, that's great. And, and if you have a sense of the second part of the question is, when do you think you would actually kind of enter that market and start, and start financing? So, so how would you do it? And, at, and then when do you think you would do it? I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. So um, I can pretty confidently say we'll be doing more than what we do now because we don't do a lot. Um, but the one thing I would qualify, though, is that what we do, because uh, I know we, we lend to light manufacturers, we lend to transportation and logistics, we lend to construction companies, we lend to ancillary industries that have to be relevant for this industry to survive in North Carolina. Um, unlike Emily, you know, Emily just talked about the, the active applications they have and, and the amount they've lent. So, you know, I, I saw the number 135 and 124 billion. Now, if you, run, if you round up 124 billion and 135 billion, that means that she's got applications in, her, in, in uh, being vetted at about $1 billion each. <laughs> so we don't do that kind of but we do lend, like I said, to solopreneurs and small businesses that may be doing some light manufacturing and trucking and things like that. And, and you know, I think I, I can't remember the number I heard about the, the amount of components. Was it 80 something that Eight, go in 8,000? 8, 8, okay, so that go in the turbine. So I'm thinking that we have to fit in there somewhere. But the key is, and you know, um, 
we were speaking about this earlier, the key is how we educate companies um, in communities, whether that be businesses owned by people of color, female-owned businesses, low to moderate income owners, veterans, um, rural areas. These are areas that have historically lacked access to capital for a number of reasons. How are we educating them on what the opportunities are so that they can enter the, the industry um, you know, in a more informed way and then be able to scale and grow their businesses as the industry grows. And so we want to be there, you know, sort of um, arm in arm with them as they, they, they go through that discovery phase and then are able to take advantage of opportunities. Yeah, very good. And I, I should note that I attended an event that Kevin's organization had a retreat um, a few months ago in Wilmington, and they had an event at a pub slash brewery slash bar afterwards that had been funded by Kevin's organization. So you will have the distinction of saying that you have funded both a pub slash brewery and some offshore wind component manufacturers. So, so that's pretty diverse. I think you're probably the only one on the panel who can say that. So Emily, let's go to you and um, tell us, you know, it sounds like you already are in this game, but um, tell us a little more about where and, and what your focus is with respect to offshore wind. Sure. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, cool. Um, so where we are with respect to offshore wind, when you look at the projects on the East Coast, um, as I said, there are about 22 that have been announced, um, uh, and that have been leased, I should When we are listing, um, when anyone lists, they're looking for a reasonable prospect of repayment of a loan. And so one of the key pieces that you have to put in place uh, for a loan application to pass muster at, uh, at the Department of Energy is that reasonable prospect of repayment. That's going to be driven if, if the, the mid-Atlantic states and the northeastern states are in an example, um, that's going to be driven by state policy. Um, so it's, it's what we call the power purchase agreement that, um, or the REC Renewable Energy Certificate Agreement. It's, it's, a, um, it's that policy push from a state saying, I think this is a very good idea and I want this resource to serve the citizens of our state. Um, and so we're looking for that power purchase agreement to be pretty far along or for the ink to have just dried, um, because that's going to be when the project reaches a milestone and we are interested, and they're probably interested, in figuring out how to make it. Now that said, in the supply chain realm, we know that one of the best things for the companies um, that participate in the offshore wind supply chain is that they're going to serve multiple um, wind farms with equipment or services over time. And so uh, it may be that um, we are financing um, a supplier uh, whose first, first client, so to speak, is um, a wind farm in, in New Jersey or something like that. And we know that in three years' time, they're going to move that supply chain down to the Carolinas because the action is going to be in the Carolinas if Total develops their project, Avangrid theirs, and Duke Energy theirs. Um, I will say that we are looking at some pretty interesting aspects of the supply chain in offshore wind. Uh, one of those is um, uh, you all probably heard about um, battery storage. Well, there are battery companies that make um, uh, batteries just for marines. There are um, vessel builders who make vessels that uh, have the equipment um, that uh, is needed to carry things out to sea. So, so specialized pieces of equipment um, that we are looking to lend to. But as far as when, a uh, big indicator for the project is going to be that um, that power purchase agreement or that state mandate. Okay, very quick follow-up question. So, does does the DLE loan program office just kind of sit back and wait for people to 
potential clients to approach it, or do you go out and seek them out, or a little bit of both? I go out and seek them out. That's why I'm wearing the, the green vest, so okay. you all will remember that person in the green vest who was talking from the loan program's office. Um, we have a business development team. Um, I have about 40 colleagues. We are scattered from Hawaii and Alaska all the way to the East Coast. Um, and we are actively assigned to sectors, and we are calling people and saying, let me tell you about um, the loan guarantees available to you. So uh, we're being very proactive in this, in this effort. Very good. Thank you. And by the way, I'm wearing a purple shirt because we are at ECU today. So. Um, all okay. right. So um, Harrison. I think this, uh, from, from a financing perspective, and I'll just say uh, one or two things about J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, and then just speak more generally about uh, about the market. I, I mean, the, the the firm has made commitments with respect to being Paris aligned, uh, with respect to sustainable development, and and, and additionally to operational efficiency. Um, you know, offshore wind uh, clearly um, you know aligns with some of those uh, more general goals. But I think, you know, for, from a, a perspective today, I'm just going to speak personally about uh, our observations uh, in the market uh, and what's, um, you know, what, what we expect to be relevant. I, I think, firstly, it's, it's a little bit of a mix of, uh, you know, leadership of the financing community, but also uh, following, or let's call it followership. <laughs> uh, from a leadership perspective, I do think there's an element of being uh, forward-leaning with respect to supporting uh, renewable energy, with respect to spending the time and the resources to understand these new asset classes uh, and, and getting comfortable with the, the technical uh, as well as the, the, the commercial considerations when looking at uh, supporting companies and projects. So I, I think there, there, there certainly is a leadership um, element uh, and a forward-leaning element, but there's also um, a, an, an element of bankability uh, where you're saying, you know, there is a desire to be supporting these types of projects, but I think when it comes to the the credit committees of uh, Department of uh, Department of Energy (LPO), when it comes to the the credit committees of uh, banks and export credit agencies that support these types of um, projects, and I suspect for the community banks and um, and other uh, other partners, they're going to be looking at um, you know reasonable assurance of repayment. So so I think there's that balance. Uh, that uh, folks are trying to reconcile uh, in the community. And I think with respect to following, um, at the end of the day, um, relationship banking uh, and, and the financing community are going to need to follow their clients into these new, these new sectors. And I think when you see established players in the utility space who have um, won these leases, uh, established OEMs uh, making uh, the, the turbines uh, and the subsea cables, uh, these are, you know, in, in many cases, they're conventional, um, conventional power players that are going into a new segment. So I think the relationships that those companies uh, and those developers have had, uh, they'll, they'll be bringing with them. And I think that's what we've seen in the first wave of investment uh, in the segment in the U.S., and, and that's what we would expect to see. Yeah, and I'll just add a little bit more, and it's going to lean more towards the small business side, as, as Kevin was talking about. I mean, when I was talking before about filling gaps, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And so I'm going to touch a little bit about credit enhancements, because I think that every one of you said there's some risk in this, this lending, right? Especially to new technologies that are going to be in the offshore wind area. And so what Green Banks traditionally do, and what the Clean Energy Fund hopes to do here in North Carolina, is to, is to help reduce the risk for those other private investors. Um, so whether that's um, maybe... Uh, reducing an interest rate um, for a CDFI loan, especially for green lending, which maybe you haven't done as much. Um, whether that's reducing the risk um, to you to come into a new a new venture that's in North Carolina, what can we offer you some sort of a um, you know a second um, um, lien or something like that? So. We are not, I, I don't know the answer to where we're going to be in, in five to 10 years. I hope that we are a part of this ecosystem because I, I feel like there might be a need for us and um, that's what we're listening to do. So um, so yes, I hope I'm, I'm still talking about this in, in five to 10 years and um, I, I don't know when I'll enter the market, but I hope that all of you have ideas and will invite us into the market and uh, be a player in it. I'm gonna go script a little bit. 
I'm going to go off script a little bit for those who know me. That's, that's not surprising. But so we know that there are 22 or so projects in process right now on the East Coast. We know the European market's more mature, both in terms of financial instruments and, and the industry in general. So, Harrison, how does, how do, what do we need to do in the U.S. to kind of get investors more comfortable? Are there particular barriers, hurdles that need to be cleared to, to, to increase the appetite in the investor market? And then on the, from the CPO perspective, are you looking for a certain uh, partnership within the private sector, banking community, whatever, just to, to bundle with your commitment and loans? Is there a, uh, you know, a, a match that you look for, a certain level of investment from, from banking community uh, that make your numbers work? Because clearly, this space is competing with all these other green energy spaces, and, and then so how do we make more room for offshore wind, and at what cost? Obviously, some of the other sectors. But um, I'm interested to hear more about how we increase the appetite among the U.S. institutions for financing these, you know, 22 projects. I, I think it's incredibly uh, relevant uh, the questions you're asking. I mean, I think what one one set of this is. Uh, other parts uh, of the world, in Europe, um, you know, Taiwan has made some strides uh, in, in this area. Have uh, you know, kind of developed this this asset class and developed the financing uh, around it. Um, I think what the folks are doing in this room uh, is is really critical in establishing the necessary conditions uh, for things like bankability and for things like um, assuring uh, commercial parties uh, being involved that uh, these are. Um, these are going to be, um, you know, lower risk uh, ventures that they're they're undertaking, you know, with, with potential upside. And I think the, in, in addition to creating the necessary conditions, um, there will absolutely be a, a need for both public uh, as well as private um, sector support uh, throughout the value chain and in the project financing uh, itself. And it, you know, I would just highlight just to give a demonstration of the fact that private and public sector are working hand in hand, and, and, and I would say uh, also national and international are working hand in hand in this kind of seamless ecosystem. Uh, it, was actually, um, it was actually Emily's colleague, uh, Carolyn Davidson, who's at Department of Energy, uh, who we're comparing notes with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, looking at projects, speaking to clients, uh, and it was incidentally, uh, my background being from uh, North Carolina, I'm a native of uh, Gastonia, uh, and speaking with Carolyn that uh, we, we established this rapport and I learned about uh, NC Towers and, and hence, hence we're here today. So I think that, uh, you know, just to demonstrate the fact that um, commercial banks, investors are speaking to key players like Department of Energy uh, that did support the growth of onshore wind, uh, the growth of PV solar, uh, and, and really kind of developed these uh, in the 10 to 15 year ago uh, time frame now is the time for offshore wind. There's new uh, aspects, uh, new risks associated with the development of these projects, and I think it's really a risk sharing between private and public parties that will be critical. Uh, one other feature I just highlight is, uh, and, and this gets to the international component, and I'd really applaud the the delegation that went to uh, Denmark. Uh, it was uh, you know, really really exciting to see that presentation because I think that there's a lot to learn from from the Nordic uh, economies and, and the strides they've made in those areas. Um, these, these countries uh, that are supporting the export of turbines, the export of the subsea cables and, and the other equipment, goods and services, uh, these governments are very supportive. And these governments may also have a role to play in the United States uh, in supporting the, these, these exports. So in addition to speaking to uh, key players in the, in the value chain that are gonna provide financing and credit enhancements. Uh, it, it even goes beyond beyond our borders. Uh, you could certainly see, and we expect to see, uh, in these projects, the participation of uh, you know, potentially Nordic, European, uh, and other export credit agencies uh, providing um, loan guarantees, partial loan guarantees, uh, alongside private and public capital here in the US. So Emily, how, how does banking, institutional financing impact 
of the decisions your organization makes with respect to, to what projects get funded and which don't? Honestly, I think um, it, Eric hit the nail on the head. We can work hand in hand with commercial lenders. Um, again, I, I think in the beginning of my presentation, I talked about uh, lending, you know, DOE lending, but in, in essence, we are actually providing a loan guarantee. And so that can play well, I think, with um, institutional money. Um, and we're, we're motivated in uh, similar but not the same way um, to get repaid. Um, we might be able to take more risk than a commercial bank would feel comfortable with or take a bigger bite, um, so to speak. Um, our lending authority expanded uh, sixfold in the last year um, to nearly $400 billion. So we have a clear signal to get out there and to finance um, and build that bridge to bankability. So, to Jen and Kevin, from the small business perspective, are there, uh, are there areas within the state of North Carolina that you see is, is rich for mining uh, as it relates to the, to the supply chain? Um, and, and what uh, barriers do you see um, to those rising to the top? So, I suspect that there are pro there's probably opportunity statewide, but it's probably more intense in the eastern part of the state, I would assume, um, in terms of OSW. But, you know, in, in terms of barriers, I think, you know, it's access to capital, but more, more importantly, access to knowledge. Because actually, um, the capital, especially after these last three years, is available. Whether it's gov federal government backed programs through DOE, through you know Build Back Better, through you know all the, the American Rescue Plan funding um, that has made it down to the municipal level, there is there there is capital out there. There's also opportunity out there. The key is connecting these small businesses who've never played in, in these spaces before um, to, to really helping them understand what the opportunity is, what the timing is relative to them needing to scale, and making sure that they scale responsibly. Because one of the problems that with small businesses can be, especially when you're talking about um, any sort of public infrastructure um, or public construction project, is sometimes you can win a bid and you actually work yourself out of business. Because if you don't have the capacity to complete projects on time, you, you know, you get hit with liquidated damages and you, you, know, you bankrupt yourself. So that's part of um, what we consider our role to be. That is either providing the, the knowledge and the technical assistance about how to manage your business operation properly or connecting them to the right resources that understand that. Um, one of the things that um, I've distributed is a piece of information on our Digital Learning Academy, which is kind of a curated library of content that um, allows small businesses to access key information about just running their business operations better, as well as things that are germane to any industry, like cybersecurity, fraud protection, and things like that. So they can just understand how to make sure that they're growing responsibly. So um, I know it's a long answer to your question, Mark, but it's, it's really about, I think, the, the access to, to knowledge and the, the, the power and really all of the resources that have been promulgated through this, this, this task force, getting that information out to small business. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I mean, I'm struck by, I can't remember whose slide it was, but someone put up a slide of all the different industries 
players that would be in this market, you know, drywall, <laughs> you know, who, who thought? But I, I think the connection, the connection in educating small businesses, even the ones that exist today, of how they can engage in this is going to be so important. And then I'll throw on top of it, you already mentioned this, Kevin, earlier, is the workforce development piece of it. Because uh, I think a lot of times, um, if a small business is in a certain segment, they don't realize that they could pretty easily transition over into another segment if they just got X training. Um, and just that knowledge and connecting them to the right um, training whether that's through your organization or others, um, as well as connecting them to that, the money. Because as I said before, the money's there. The money's especially there now with all of the federal grants that are coming. We just need to be able to connect those small businesses to it. All right, I'm going to ask a question that's kind of a follow-up to something that some of you have already addressed in just, just recently, and that is, I mean, this task force is set up to facilitate offshore wind economic resource strategies and so what what can this task force do to help grease the skids for you to, to make it make you more willing and able to invest in this new you know emerging sector I can say you know um, we've just got to figure out how to dare I say it, transcend politics and make sure that there's an investment at the state level in this industry. I mean, the, you know, we can see how we've seen presentations today, you know, Virginia, Maryland, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't specifically hear from, you know, Massachusetts and New York, but I mean, throughout the eastern seaboard, this industry is drawing a lot of attention and investment. And now, um, North Carolina needs it. Because we'll invest time, and look, I, I'm, I'm saying things that, that would you know, may, may get state employees in trouble to say, so I, so I can say. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, we, we'll, we'll definitely invest time if there is the, the, the ability for um, the state to land some of these projects, because the opportunity is, is just obvious. And Kevin, just to, to clarify, your investments, they need to be based in North Carolina, is that correct? Or can you invest out of state? Um, right now in North Carolina. Very good. Anyone else want to chime in on that question? Emily or, or Harrison? Or, and if not, yes. just oh, Emily. Oh, oh. Yes. Yes, please go ahead. That's a really great question. And I think Power if you carry one message, you know, to the Western state, and it offshore was not just a coastal place, so to speak. Some of the uh, most uh, most interesting economic that I have seen in offshore wind is the fact that some agreement was the first person cable from Huntersville, North Carolina. Um, and that's and completely my thought. Um, I think it's important to understand that offshore wind has the potential to benefit us from, um, you know, we, we have those banks, you know, from the boats to the mountains. Um, and there may be, um, and this is something for NC Towers to explore, you know, the benefit of shopping regional um, with, uh, our brothers and sisters of you know north and south, and to see if there is um, a way to cooperate on economic development that brings even more benefit to the area than would otherwise um, be the case if each state acted independently. I know that we have ACC and. SEC football issues that might separate our states, but um, we sometimes have to put those on the back burner. Yeah, I think just, just tacking on a couple of comments, I think, to, to Emily's, which were, were spot on. Um, the, uh, the, the collaborative element to this, uh, this forum, I think, is, is really helpful. Just getting back to this point of necessary conditions, I think when it does come to the final investment decision, of the developers, um, these are you know very sophisticated players who know what is going to need to be in place, and then uh, from from a last mile perspective, 
uh, that comfort goes a long way to get uh, the financing community behind uh, these projects once they're kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, going fully on their way. Uh, so, so I think uh, just thinking comprehensively about uh, the, the task in front uh, is, is really, I think, a key achievement of this, of this forum. The, the second thing I'd say is just kind of anecdotally uh, speaking, uh, especially after the IRA uh, w was put out uh, and speaking with some of the original equipment manufacturers, the OEMs, uh, in, in this space, uh, they're all doing a couple of things at the same time. I think one is um, trying to understand economically uh, how the, these benefits can translate into their models uh, on the on the on the downside, there's been some uh, th there's been some inflation in terms of the supply chains uh, that affects their economics. But on the uh, on the upside, there's been an accommodative legal and regulatory and um, you know incentives based uh, policies that, that that encourage investment. So so I think that's um, that that's something that these companies are toggling. But additionally, when you have state to state competition uh, to produce a, per a particular um, piece of equipment, uh, from an economy of scale perspective, it probably won't make sense to have uh, one production facility in each state. So I think, you know, it, just really to applaud both the, uh, the, the aspect of getting the various stakeholders together, uh, but also the state-to-state -state communication, I think it, it is quite helpful because in this federal, federal um, kind of uh, uh, system uh, that we have, uh, those uh, conversations might otherwise be siloed unnecessarily. Harrison, uh, how long how long is it going to take to close one of these deals? And then how many institutions are you talking about being involved in that? I think that, um, and this, you know, there's been some um, the you know, public information uh, shared about uh, the Vineyard Wind uh, project, which is the first large-scale uh, offshore wind uh, project that uh, achieved final investment decision and, and put debt financing in place. Um, I, I think that's kind of a, a case study for how long things can take with, uh, and, and that's with a comprehensive, uh, you know, state level and, and, and federal policies that were supportive of the development of that, uh, of that project. Um, I, I think that you know, if you look at some of the the information that was uh, that was put out, doing a, a, a kind of look back on, on the process for uh, the, the the financing for that project, uh, I think it's uh, really um, uh, a, a process of uh, permitting development, circling financing, all at the same time, socializing and educating. I think you know, Kevin's point was was a key one. Uh, and the various uh, groups that are going to be looking at this for the first time. Uh, so I think if you look, um, just as an example, uh, so some of the information uh, shared was that uh, there were there were 60 financial institutions initially under discussion for that project, uh, and it ultimately be, ended up being nine banks uh, that that were leading the, the project finance facility. Uh, and there's of course other aspects uh, that that are involved in in making these projects successful. But I think you know, in, in an environment where there were a, a number of factors that enabled that project to uh, to get underway, um, you know, I, I think the, uh, the the pipeline in other states is going to be just really dependent on on um, you know that particular regulatory and legal environment, um, because I think that really that last mile of financing uh, following the final investment decision is only going to to come when. Uh, you know, there's there's clear visibility on on the PPA, the lease, and kind of the key fundamentals uh, that 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 will uh, get commercial parties comfortable uh, putting forward the the capital necessary for these projects. And I'll note to our moderators, we have about 15 minutes remaining for this panel. So, Madam Chair, we have about. Eight questions left, which we could delve into some of those. Or if you'd like to open it up to task force members, that's certainly a possibility too. So. Well, I'll ask if if anyone has questions at this point for our panelists. Steve. Yeah, just a quick one, and it's a little bit of a follow-on to the last discussion, but. 
there's a lot of incentives programs out there at the federal level, the state level, other levels, um, working with utilities and such. Do any of you have any capability or uh, ability to help figure out how to, I think the term of art being used these days is grade some of these different types of incentive programs together as a part of the financing discussion? Yeah, yeah that, that is, Steve, one of the roles that we're hoping to play. Um, maybe not at the large turbine level, but certainly when we start to get into the, um, the different tiers of the supply chain, um, trying to figure out where those are. Um, one of the things I didn't mention before um, are, are some of the tax credits and, and things that are coming out. And I think what we're trying to, to figure out is how do we make sure that, that those are getting to the right people. And if they don't, don't qualify for them, how do we get a qualified entity to take the tax credits that we can pass along? So, so yeah, I mean, at, at, a, at, a, at a foundational level, that's a role that, that the Clean Energy Fund is hoping to play. Yeah, Steve, I, I, would, um, I would agree. And I think it, it, it comes down again to um, assessing fit, you know, so some of the incentives, what are they looking to incentivize? How big are the projects they're looking to incentivize? Or are they trying to, you know, incentivize small companies to have greener fleets, as we talked about earlier? You know, so, um, and, and those could be really valuable tools because, you know, um, in, in our line of business, um, we do basically, I mean, the securitization of our financing doesn't have to be that significant, but when there's an incentive that can put, you know, inject 10%, 20% of equity into a deal, it's just going to lessen the interest rate and make the deal more palatable and make it more affordable for the small business um, and hopefully more profitable with their operations. So it's just a matter of the education and figuring out one in what incentives or grant programs can be coupled with, with low interest loans. All right, back to you, John. All right, I'm going to go to the lightning round question. Um, we, can, we can bounce back to the other questions, too, but um, here's the question. Two parts. What one recommendation do you have that would advance the offshore wind, indus offshore wind industry in the U.S., but also protect rate payers? So we want to move the industry forward, but we want to do it in a way that protects rate payers. And you all are ready with cash on hand just to give it out. So how do we, what, what would you recommend to facilitate that? We lend dollars up, you don't give it up. Okay, yeah, <laughs> lend, lend, lend. <laughs> Be clear. <laughs> How lightning are we doing this? Uh, <laughs> that was very lightning. Now, I would say, I actually, it goes back to what Steve just said, the braiding, right? Like, like figuring out what are those other incentives that are out there, whether it's the federal level, the state level, even some local, local incentives that might be out there, braiding that in with low-cost capital that we can bring either from LPO or other, other um, lending entities, um, and just making sure we're bringing down the, the cost um, before it gets out to the, the rate payers um, to pay. You know, from a recommendation perspective, I, I just, uh, uh, again, just applaud the fact that um, this committee was put together, um, bringing together these the, these stakeholders and, and bringing the, the, the key issues uh, to bear. I think from a recommendations perspective, I think um, you've got the right folks in the room to um, to, to, to drive, you know, what, what, what's actionable. Uh, so, so, so I won't, um, you know, put forward a uh, a specific recommendation other than that and I think with respect to um, uh, you know with with respect to um, sorry that the second limb of the question how do you um, protect rate payers? Oh, the rate payers yeah, yeah I, I, I mean I think that you know the arc of this this industry has been um, you know from 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 uh, higher cost to low cost uh, and, and you know what can be very very competitive Marginal costs drawing drawing upon a, a renewable resource. So, I think you know for, from a secular secular growth perspective, I think that um, you know the, the the outlook for ratepayers could be quite uh, uh, quite quite favorable. But I think um, you know in, in the interim there there does need to be a concerted push um, you know to get uh, to get these projects off the ground for the first time in a, in a scalable way. 
I did want to add, um, so, and, and excuse me if this is overly simplistic, but we have to make it relevant. Um, and, and actually, I like the way you posed the question because I think part A and part B are go hand in hand. Um, to a small business that's having trouble making, or is, is questioning how they're gonna make payroll next month, saying, hey, you should, you should convert your fleet to green. It's like not, that's not, that's not accessible information. Um, but, there, but there are, I mean, we all, we're all in this space in, in some form or another, some of us deeper than others. So we, we understand why offshore wind and by extension other green um, and, and renewable energy sources are really important. But there's a, I mean, there's just masses of people and small businesses out there that have no reason to care. And so we have to, I think we have to equip the messengers, which I guess are us, with the right tools to really get the message out there. We have some of them. I mean, you know, we, we definitely, I think, have some good starts, but I, I just, you know, there, there's been just different movements within this country that have started within sort of a small cadre of people that then have gone to the masses, and, and this needs to be the next one. Um, so especially with a lot, a lot of you know the carbon neutral goals that I read about by 2035, by 2050, by 20, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll never hit them unless people um, in you know marginalized communities understand why being green is relevant. Um, so, again, sorry for over simplicity. If I may just un underscore one or two of the, the, those points, Kevin, because I think that um, really uh, it, it, it's key because I think it's it's small and medium businesses, uh, but it's many. <laughs> it's a very, it, when you aggregate all of this, it's a very substantial need across all of these companies and proprietorships and, uh, and the like. And I think, you know, we're talking about so many different things when we're talking about financing the big, you know, the big glamorous uh, project you know, from the, from the turbine uh, to kind of the, the value chain. And, you know, when you, uh, I was speaking earlier about the, this pre-shipment uh, segment of, uh, of making the goods uh, for, for the, these types of projects. And I think, you know, what we find when we look at uh, factoring and supply chain finance programs is uh, things are generally uh, financed at the point of invoicing uh, when a lot of the outlay uh, has been done by these small businesses. And really, when you want to get to that un, uh, unbanked portion of the, the corporate population, uh, you look out and say, these are people who need to make payroll, who are really making big bets and putting, uh, you know, putting collateral on the line to get uh, the next shipment over the line. Uh, the, the sort of commercial banking community doesn't, it hasn't been as good at meeting the requirements of, of, of those stakeholders. So I think you know, looking at programs at scale uh, that can serve multiple SME uh, groups, I think will be will be important. And because uh, when you for every uh, for every uh, you know turbine, let's say there's there's so many components and uh, a multiplier of these uh, stakeholders. Emily, anything you'd like to add? I would add. We should brace the fact that North Carolina did not come in first. So we're not the first one with steel in the water. We want to be. We have a vision back in uh, 20, 2010 or so, or 2009. But there are huge benefits to the fact that we are a second or third mover, so to speak, um, in terms of the learning curve and the price curve here. Let's embrace that. Um, some things that we've learned um, or that we've observed at a macro level is that when um, offshore wind developers do multiple projects, there are even larger economies of scale. That means that the, you know, the, the cost of the wind power to the electricity customers in North Carolina could be more reasonable than it is 
for the first mover to map it to them. The other thing that we've I've observed is the fact that um, when you have a whole bunch of wind farms being built all at one time, um, those folks who are developing the project end up being quite tapered in terms of there's so much demand for the seal or for the carbon fiber or for that um, for the anchor materials, that kind of thing, that they don't actually have much ability to secure lower prices in that supply chain for the project. And again, that goes back to the prices that people pay for electricity in North Carolina. And then a third thing that I'm observing, and this is, you'll see my electricity nerd come out here, and that's that we have the potential to think to where the grid needs to be from where we are here in North Carolina. We think in North Carolina about the, you know, the three leaf areas off the coast. What if those three leaf areas were connected? What if those three leaf areas were connected all the way up to the leaf area in Virginia? How would that change? the reliability, the pricing of power in North Carolina. New Jersey is looking at this. It's called um, planning for a mesh network of, um, of export cables, um, as well as um, not intra-risk, I would say, um, between um, farms, between uh, Australian facilities. But we have the benefit of their experience. So let's embrace our second mover and let's learn from others. And lastly, I think there are probably examples in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York about how to um, how best to bring small businesses into the fold. Um, and I think some wind farms do very targeted supplier events um, just for small businesses. Um, and so those, those are the things that come to mind for me is uh, really look at what's been done and um, see if we can harvest all the benefit of learning that's gone on or is going on in the Northeast in the Atlanta. All right, we have about three more minutes, so if there is any final wrap up you guys would like to do. I have one final question. Hopefully this does not open a can of worms. We, we, we all assume that this is going to develop, that we're essentially developing a new market, but is there a chance that it won't or that it will develop at a suboptimal pace? Does, does that worry any of you? Or do you think it's going to work out? Tough question. Scared to answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We won't hold you to it. I mean, I'm I'm a little bit concerned. I I, I feel um, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I I think there probably are certain forces that would like the industry to not grow as fast as it could, but um, there's too many reasons that are compelling for it to grow fast, even amongst some of the forces that don't want it to. Because there's, because there's revenue to be made, which means there are taxes to be paid, which means there are revenues, public sector revenues to be gained. And then there's tons of, you know, Harrison just used the term multipliers. I mean, there's, there's, so if there are 8,000 component parts for a wind turbine, think about how many industries that, that impacts and, um, you know, as it relates to small businesses, you hear statistics of anywhere between 67 and 80 percent of all of the jobs in this country being created by small business. So that's, you know, mom's hot dogs and apple pie. It shouldn't be um, controversial, but hopefully the, 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 for, hopefully the, 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 the positive forces outweigh the negative. I would just add, um to, to, to the point Emily made about um, you know the, the sequencing of the states and North Carolina's desire to be the first, uh, but you know we, we are um, 
you know, we are where we are in terms of uh, other, other states have gotten to closer to the finish line uh, by now. I think it, it's an opportunity as well sometimes. It's good not to be the first because I think you can take a look at the models that have been successful, look at the minutia. I know when we were preparing for this, this panel, we had some exchanges about you know, what has been done and what has been successful. So uh, again, sometimes it's great to be the first, but sometimes better not to be. <laughs> And I'll just quickly say, I mean, as a, as a human, <laughs> I hope it does work. So thank you for all the work that you all are doing. Um, and I, I just, more generally, um, in, in, the, in the finance space, I, I, I go back to the um, kind of the educational component um, that Kevin was talking about before. I think if we're educating everyone on the benefits of this, not just the climate benefits of this, not even just the economic development benefits of it, but the benefits that mean the most to the people um, that are affected by everything that's happening, I think, um, we're all going to come to the same consensus that we need to do this. We need to do something um, big. So, all right, Emily, final word. I unmuted Emily. Uh, final word. Uh, uh, you know, thank you for pulling this together and for uh, inviting uh, Dave Reed. As far as uh, the future of NC Power. Um, build on the momentum that you have and um, keep going. This is a statewide project, regionalized project. Um, the benefits, as Jen said, um, and as Kevin said, um, are many. And let the key piece we need right now going forward is that, that creation of demand um, to, for for. Um, an entity, whether it's regulatory or, or legislature-led, to say, go buy this, let, let, let's adopt this resource as a policy, as, as an economic resource um, into the state, and then that will translate into um, Harrison and, and the Low Loan Programs Office being interested in financing because there may be a reasonable prospect of repayment of a loan. So I think the next piece is really putting in place that policy that supports the demand for offshore All right, that's a good note to end it on. Thank you very much, panelists. That was great. And thank you on behalf of the task force. Harrison mentioned Rump Multiplier and Kevin Mom Apple Pie and Hot Dogs, all that. What we have to remember is those things are a part of this too. Those ancillary businesses, hospitality, transportation, and all other ancillary services help feed our economy and support this industry. So small businesses to large businesses all have a role in this, in this offshore wind sector. Uh, as we transition to our next speaker, I am, uh, as our technology team gets set up for our next presenter, I'm going to allow Task Force member Justin Sassen to make an announcement. Justin? If you would unmute, Justin. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for, for being in. I really appreciate it. Uh, sorry not to be there with you in person, but uh, Matt and Sharon just wanted to briefly share uh, an update for the, the committee or the task force on uh, activities that the UK are, are undertaking in the next month or two. Uh, so we will be having a, a leading a delegation um, to the UK of, of North Carolina uh, stakeholders, including academics and policymakers and educators, uh, to meet with their counterparts and also participate in the second uh, working group of the memorandum of understanding between. UK and North Carolina. We're looking forward to welcoming Secretary Sanders, the new Madam Chair, uh, Chris Chung, and others to the UK, uh, Manchester, Liverpool, and North Wales. Uh, the focus of the delegation, which will also include, I believe, several of the other folks that are, that are sitting in the room today, uh, will be to look at the intersection of workforce development and clean energy and how we can uh, work together uh, further in that space. And, and that topic and that focus step from uh, Manchester Mayor. And he learned to visit North Carolina and his admiration for what North Carolina is doing in this space. So uh, I think there'll be a lot of learnings uh, and lessons to be shared. I'm also happy to report 
uh, the UNC professor Greg Angie will be leading a group of students. Uh, they're going to attend football showroom in London uh, and then be in the hall meeting with uh, stakeholders there around the offshore wind, uh, the same week that will be in Manchester. So uh, if you're interested in any of those uh, topics further, please feel free to reach out. Uh, but again, thank you for a few minutes to share an update. Thank you, Justin. We appreciate that and look forward to follow, uh, following up with our friends in the UK. All right. At this time, our next presenter is going to talk about supply chain readiness, ISO certification. You heard our, some of our presenters earlier, John Morrison and Maynard uh, Smith, talk about what businesses, what companies have to do to be ready to be certified on their uh, provided on their vendor list, supply chain list. So, Angela Barger is an improvement specialist at NC State Industry Expansions where she assists organizations pursuing environmental and or safety management systems to achieve their goals through coaching and mentoring. She also performs training and internal audits for the ISO 14001 and ISO 45001 standards. Prior to joining IES, Angela served as manager of the NCDEQ Environmental Stewardship Initiative for 15 years delivering training and assistance on environmental management systems and a wide range of other environmental and sustainability topics. She also worked with NCDEQ's Division of Air Quality as a permit engineer for seven years, so she's very familiar with this industry, and we look forward to hearing from you, Angela. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you for inviting me. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about ISO management systems, I know it was mentioned earlier. How many of you had heard about ISO before they just brought it up randomly? A few of you. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so hopefully I'll give you a little bit of information about what an ISO system is and also um, how NC State can, can assist these uh, facilities with actually implementing those and, and maintaining them over time. <laughs> So first, let's talk a little bit about what ISO is. Um, ISO is the name of an international organization for standardization, um, which is an independent, non-governmental, international organization. Um, has about 164 members um, that are all national standard bodies in other countries, as well as the U.S. So ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, is the U.S. member, um, and they are a founding member of, of this organization. But because International Organization for Standardization would have different acronyms and all these different languages, um, they chose to go with ISO as a word. Um, and it's based on the Greek isos, meaning equal. So think about things like isosceles triangles or isobaric pressure, things like that. Um, so anytime we're talking about ISO, no matter what country you're in, it's ISO. It's not ISO. It's not a, um, an acronym. So just, you know, when you're, you're going about talking about ISO, it's ISO. It's not ISO. Um, I know, it's, it's just one of those little nitpicky things. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in 1987, ISO published its first quality management standard. Um, and standards in the ISO 9000 family have gone on to become some of the most well-known and implemented standards. Um, in 1996, they added ISO 14001, um, which is the environmental management standard, so kind of my bread and butter. Um, and then in 2018, they added ISO 45001, which is occupational health and safety, as well as 50001, which is energy management. So when we talk about ISO management standards, there's a whole bunch of them. So it was nice that I got to sit down and talk to John a little bit at lunch um, to figure out exactly what it is they were kind of thinking about when they brought up using ISO within um, this, this group. And he was specifically talking about um, the quality standard, which is 9001, but any and all of these um, can fit. Oops, okay. um, all of these standards, they're voluntary, they're widely adopted, and some customers even demand implementation. Um, in order to even require certification uh, because you can implement these standards without necessarily getting a third-party certification just you know for your own uh, business processes um, but 
if a customer is requiring it of you, they are probably looking for you to become third party certified. So each standard is auditable because they set criteria that must be accomplished. And any time the word shall is used um, in the standard itself, that's a, um, an element that must be addressed. Right? That's a statement that they have to do something about. And then how it's addressed is completely up to the company. Um, so that's what makes it confusing, right? It doesn't say you must do this and this is how you have to do it. It says you must do this, now you figure out how to do it, and then prove to us that it meets the requirement. So what is a management system? When we're talking about a management system, um, basically it's a proven tool that provides a framework um, that helps any organization manage its activities, allows successful pursuit of their policies and goals. Right, so I talked about energy, I talked about environment, I talked about health and safety, I talked about quality. So all of those, you are looking at different um, elements within those standards that you would be needing to meet. Right? It can be uh, used by any organization, whether it's large or small, regardless of the field of activity. I've seen management systems put in at landfills, I have seen management systems at um, uh, utilities. I have seen them in large businesses like Corning and Dell. I've seen them in small businesses that had only one or two, three people. Um, so it can be applied anywhere. But they're a lot of work. Um, they do provide a, system a systematic way of managing your organization's affairs um, related to whichever specific management system that we're talking about being implemented. It helps give order and consistency um, for the organization in order to address their concerns. Um, it does that through making sure that you've allocated the right resources, that you've assigned uh, responsibilities to the correct people, that you have an ongoing evaluation of your practices and procedures and processes. Um, but what it really does, all of these standards, what they do is they ensure that there's a focus on continual improvement instead of maintaining the status quo. So all of the ISO management systems are also designed around this PDCA cycle, or the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle. Um, you may have also heard about this called a dimming cycle. Um, so as you can see on the graphic, each of the sections fall within one part um, of the cycle. So all of the standards are basically based on the same um, title blocks, right? Um, so you've got four through six that are part of the plan cycle, seven and eight are part of the do cycle, um, nine is check, and 10 is improvement, and each one of those is broken down slightly differently within each of the, um, the uh, uh, different standards. So in the plan section, basically you say what you're gonna do. You determine what or your organizational context is, you define what your leadership role is, um, you set your policy, you plan for improvement, um, and you determine what support you're going to need. And then in the do section, that's where you do what you say you're going to do, right? Um, that's where your operational controls are, where you have resources, training, communication, and documentation. And then you check or you prove that you're doing what you said. Um, and then finally you act on those findings and the data to improve that system which leads to starting the cycle all over. So you'll notice it never ends. It's a very long-term process to have a, a system in place, right? Um, it can take a year or even two to put a system in place in the first place, and then it is the length of time um, that your business exists that you will continue to maintain it. Because it's all about continual improvement. You don't want to sit still. This is not something you write and then set up on a shelf um, and allow it to collect dust. This is to help you manage your business. Um, all of the most recent versions of the ISO management systems, whether that's 9,000 for quality, 14 for environment, 45 for um, health and safety, or 50 for um, energy, they all have the same high-level structure with common definitions, common terminology. It makes integration easier. So a lot of companies have started putting in all of these various ones, or at least two or three of them, um, sometimes at the same time, sometimes they combine them later. But because of this common structure, they're able to integrate them. Um, so if you're working with context of the organization, it's always gonna fall in section four. 
If you're uh, looking at support, it's always seven. If you're looking at performance evaluation, that's always section nine. Um, the details inside of each of these sections are specific to whichever topic that we're talking about. Uh, but having them organized in the same order uh, with common language just makes that implementation um, uh, in multiple systems uh, much easier. Okay, so why do businesses care? Um, why would they choose to implement a system? Well, it can help support those ESG or environment, social, and governance claims um, that demonstrate sustainability of your organization. Um, Certification to these systems can also be used as a marketing tool. Um, as noted before, you know, customers sometimes even demand it. Um, since ISO systems are all based on continual improvement, they also help improve the efficiency of your processes. Um, and these improvements can also help improve your customer satisfaction ratings. And finally, sometimes making these improvements are the only way for an organization <coughs> to survive, particularly in tough um, financial or hiring markets like we're in right now, that hiring is really, really hard, so you need to be much more efficient, right? And do more with less um, resources. So why do customers care? Well, they want you to have a system because if you can meet the requirements of a voluntary standard with oversight from a third party, then you should be able to meet their, with their requirements, right? It can mean that they accept the results of these certification audits instead of them having to perform on-site visits themselves. And of course, it demonstrates your commitment to continual improvement. Um, and also, it just allows them to be able to compare apples to apples. If they're looking at two different suppliers, one of them is certified and the other one is not, they know that this one has some oversight. Or if they're looking at two so that they have a backup, if they know that two suppliers are both certified to the system, then in theory, they should have comparable products and it should be easily interchangeable. Okay. So, how can NC State help? Well, um, we can help design and implement uh, <coughs> systems along with you. Um, I was talking to John about this at, at lunch. You know, it's, this is not something that you want an outside person to come in and do completely for you because you need the system to work for you. Um, so in order for that to happen, then you have to be very involved in the creation of the process because you're the one who's going to have to maintain it every time. But we can help with the design and implementation. Um, we can provide training and coaching on any of the standards that I've been talking about as well as you can see some of the others. Um, that are specific like to medical devices and automotive and aerospace. Um, we provide training on internal auditing um, or we can perform, perform internal or pre-assessment audits for you. Um, but we're not a third-party registrar so we can't provide that certification to the standard. Basically we can do everything up to helping support it but they would still have to um, contract with a third-party registrar. We also have training and coaching available on practical project management, performance excellence, or the Baldridge Award, um, and quality core tools. You can see all of that here. Um, and that's just what our small group within NC State uh, IES does. Um, there's a lot more. <laughs> um, while we perform some open enrollment courses, um, most of our work is actually customized based on the needs of the customers. So our group is not-for-profit. Um, it's a part of the extension service of NC State's College of Engineering. It has a variety of funding paths, including state and university, as well as some federal grant money. But a lot of our work is done on a fee-for-service model. We also work really closely with the, um, the, the community college system. So a lot of times they can use workforce development funds to, to help pay for some of our classes for local companies and things like that. So I know I've taught at least two classes, and I've only been with NC State for a year. Um, that were funded through community college workforce development. So funding for some of this stuff is out there, um, even for, for the smaller companies that don't have the resources. All right, but doing this customized allows us to tailor our assistance to the specific needs of the company. Um, like I said, these systems can take a year or two to implement and they have to be maintained, continually improved. Um, if they're not continually improved, then you can lose your certification. So again, you can't just put it on paper and put it on a shelf and be done with it. So what we like to do is act as a trusted partner in this effort and help them um, in whatever ways they need. 
So here's the group of awesome women that I work with. Uh, the four of us, as well as any third party contractors we might need um, when necessary, help perform this training and assistance to the ISO standards. Um, we have other groups in our organization that assist with lean and OSHA training, cybersecurity, um, manufacturing, automation, and a wide variety of other um, services. Um, we also have regional managers all across the state. Um, these guys come in, sit down, and discuss the needs with the company um, and basically figure out how NC State's IES um, can actually best support them um, with the education and tools that they need to not only continue to survive in North Carolina, but to thrive and, and get better and, and grow. See, I think I caught us up. You did, questions? indeed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Angela? All right. we, we know those certifications are important to a lot of the um, developers and they require them in order for companies to be certified on their list. So uh, we appreciate the work you're doing there. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone. Um, appreciate you letting me make a, a short presentation. Um, I just want to start here with the cover sheet by thanking um, by thanking the members of our committee, in particular our staff, uh, Gina and Lex. We would not be here without them. I also want to say today um, that I'm missing my partner, my co-chair Susie Hamilton, who could not be here today. I feel a little naked up here without without <laughs> being here today. Um, and just to uh, remind you that our uh, charge is to identify and engage offshore wind stakeholders. That's all categories of stakeholder, all locations, all formats. Um, our job is to share and bring information. Um, and in today's presentation, um, I'm starting to feel a little bit like it might be time to start engaging with some stakeholders among the manufacturers and the supply chain folks and the finance folks. And our committee stands ready to sort of lock arms with your subcommittee and help you through that because we have, we have good experience in that regard at this point. So the primary thing that I want to report on today is the um, uh, open house that we had in Brunswick County. This was our first open house format. We've done some small round tables, um, but, but we, so we went to Brunswick County because we knew that was a hotbed of interest about offshore wind um, with the projects down there. Um, we wanted to um, have a listening session with that community. We wanted to bring them some good information because we had heard from our reconnaissance that there was some bad information out there in the community. So we went down uh, there. We appreciate those of you um, who were able to join us. Uh, we had a large number of subject, subject matter experts. Um, we had great numbers. Um, we did it in the afternoon, late afternoon, so that we could get people after work or after school or, or all of that. We, we got 91 attendees, which the folks who do these kinds of things say 91 people is a really good number. Um, so we were excited about that. They reflected the demographics of the community. Um, we had eight tables of experts, um, and we had presentations by Boehm, uh, Southeast Wind Coalition, North Carolina Commerce. Um, it was a good afternoon and evening of engagement. Um, we had nine task force members, three subcommittee members, and nine staff in attendance. We got some good uh, coverage. You see some of our folks here, uh, WRAL and WECT-TV. Uh, we want to really express particular thanks 
to Jennifer Munt and um, Outreach Commember uh, Whit Tuttle for doing interviews with these outlets. And they got some of our key messages into these pieces, which was really um, great for us. Um, we got good feedback. Um, part of, you know, you know I expressed um, in introducing some of the sessions there that if people felt that they had been heard, that we had done a good job that day. We, we had done our work, and we felt as though we accomplished that. Uh, we had tracking forms, uh, mechanisms, so we tracked uh, 53 conversations that engaged 58% of the attendees. You can see the breakdown of positive, negative, neutral, mixed reaction there. We had survey responses. We got um, surveys available. We got fewer of those. You could take the survey online or on paper, uh, your preference. So we had those tools around the room, and they gave us some, some good feedback. And again, the primary goal was to make sure that people felt that they were being hit, heard. And the more that you survey them and give them opportunities for engagement, the more they've been heard. So we thought all of that, um, all of that was very positive. Um, so again, we tracked feedback from three-fourths of the attendees. Nearly half of those were categorized as positive, um, a fair amount of negative. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, so we got 66 responses um, in total. Again, 72% of the attendees, if none of those were duplicated. Uh, this was not a, a project of our uh, subcommittee, but members of the task force did attend. Uh, North Carolina um, Tower staffer Susan Fleetwood, Gina Renfro, Dana uh, Magliola created and staffed a booth for NC Towers at the State Energy Conference, um, hosted by the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center. Um, and uh, Governor Cooper's address at that time highlighted, highlighted the economic opportunities we've been talking about today for offshore wind as well as the, um, the work of the task force. Um, our offshore wind newsletter, if you are not receiving this, you really ought to be. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool. Um, we're able. <laughs> You know, one of the topics that came up, again, this is the way these things happen, um, the whole military response to the initial release, and that was seeming to get traction in the media, and this is a mechanism where we could put out good information, um, and Jennifer was able to do that um, through that article. So if you're not receiving this, contact our Gina Renfro at Commerce. You see that address there. Um, we will make sure that you get that. Um, our subscribership has increased 25% since our launch in December, and we will continue to push that. Um, and then finally, um, again, not a project of our committee, uh, but we, uh, our, our uh, chair uh, did appear on um, North Carolina Impact. I was able to watch that program. I hope that you were. Uh, it was a really good opportunity for us to get a message out. Um, uh, about the work of this task force. And that's all I have. Any questions? Just a comment. Yes, sir. Um, I really enjoyed working the booth at the State Energy Conference, and it was very heavy on solar, but I feel like we were the new kid, popular kid on the block because so many people came to talk to us about offshore wind, and they were excited about it, and they were learning about it, even at an energy conference. So I think doing outreach like that was super productive um, for, for the effort. So just some positive feedback on that. Thank you very much. And we're learning as we go. We've learned a lot about this. We've tailored our message. The Offshore Wind 101 uh, that became you know, apparently necessary. And so, yes, thank you. Appreciate that. We'll continue to learn and, and grow here. Anyone else? Any more questions or comments for Ben? Hi, good afternoon, Michelle Mary and John Harden. And is Justin still with us? Justin Sonsi, our co-chair, he was with us earlier. But um, thank you, Mayor, for um, letting us go out of order. I'd gotten distracted by the fine display of popcorn. No. <laughs> 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 we, 
we had in the lobby. So anyway, with that, I'm going to let you uh, uh, start our presentation for today. I'm not sure what our first thought. So this is just a quick overview of our, uh, I'm John Gordon, by the way, one of the staff people for this, to this subcommittee. Susan Fleetwood is also a staff person. I just want to make a minor correction to something that was said earlier. I think it was Dana who mistakenly said that his subcommittee was the best. It's actually this subcommittee is the best. So, so yeah, the, the record needs to be corrected on that. So here's, here's our task. Basically, if it's, if it's offshore wind supply chain related, um, we can address it, and we are addressing it. Um, that's a, it's a big task, but we are up to it. So we have outlined several tasks that, um, some of which I'm going to report on here, some not, but these are the ones that we are actively working on. Um, for a little bit of context uh, and a little bit of motivation, I want to present this slide, which um, is from a brand new report that was issued by the American Clean Power Association um, in this month, uh, so in 2023, May of 2023. And as you can see, I won't read the print on the left, but as you can see, this has shows the global installed offshore wind capacity in 2022. So this is in the previous year. As you can see, then this, I think a lot of people may not know this, the largest country is actually China. We talk a lot about Europe, and Europe is a, historically a leader, and they still are, are way up there. I mean, if you include United Kingdom, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, Belgium, all those, it, it probably adds up to more than China. But as a country, China is the leader. Way down at the far right um, in this red circle is the United States. On the one hand, you can look at that and get a little depressed. On the other hand, you can say, hey, we have nowhere to go but up, and that's a huge opportunity. And um, this is what this task force is about, is, is at least with respect to North Carolina, is making sure that we um, get our fair share of, of, of delving into that market. And so this subcommittee um, focuses on that to some extent. Um, I'm, I'm actually got, not going to cover this much. This is a recap of something that we presented at the, at the last meeting, but I do want to say that um, you know, the U.S. has a goal of, um, of, of establishing 30, 30 gigawatts of power from offshore wind by 2030. Um, we can get there, but that's going to require a very significant ramp up in a lot of areas, domestic manufacturing, ports, vessels, workforce, all of those are going to need to ramp up and, and quickly to, to meet those 2030 uh, targets. A report that was done by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, in 2023, January of 2023, it outlines all the different actions that need to be taken, many of the things that the Towers Task Force is undertaking as well as the subcommittee um, are consistent with those recommendations. North Carolina is really well positioned for all the reasons that you've heard about. We've got a manufacturing um, tradition. We are well located you know, on the East Coast. We have ports. We have three approved wind energy areas all under lease. We've got all the pieces, but we're going to have to act to, to make, put those pieces together and bring them about to realize North Carolina's share of the opportunity. So here's what this subcommittee is doing along those lines. You want me to just get going? Or would you like to comment? Oh, well, I, think, thank I think she deputized me. To, to, I absolutely. To, so, sorry. Um, so the, the first thing we're doing is we're making sure that people are aware of the companies that North Carolina has that are in the offshore wind supply chain. So when we started this a few years ago, we developed our own North Carolina offshore wind supply chain, but that has always been an intake device on the Department of Commerce's website. We have not made it an, an output device, a display device. We have, we have, in the last few months, explored the various ways we could do that in a, in a manner that's efficient and effective. We considered partnering with the Business Network for Offshore Wind, which has um, probably the most robust supply chain registry out there, but it does cost money to, to integrate with that and have that be our supply chain database as well. And it, always, it also does not have an optimal, in our opinion, 
um, display device. It's not easy to retrieve information from that or download it. And so what we've decided to do is partner with the Southeastern Wind Coalition. And when Dana was presenting um, earlier this morning, he had a display from their supply chain registry. And as you saw, it had a map. It had icons that showed the various companies. You can filter it by type of company, type of component. And what we're going to do is we are working right now with the Southeastern Wind Coalition to essentially piggyback, North Carolina piggyback on their interface, but we're going to customize it to some extent so that when you link to it from the Department of Commerce's website, you see North Carolina and only North Carolina, not the entire Southeast, for example. We're not against the entire Southeast, but this is a North Carolina website, and so that's what we're going to, what we're going to focus on. Um, and um, we are in the contracting phase right now with the Southeastern Wind Coalition, and that will be coming up soon. Um, we also are in the process of convening regional workshops. Um, Michelle is, is leading this effort. And yes, please. So along the lines of supply chain development, it was really interesting. I attended the, the NC State Energy Conference and the keynote speaker, and Steve, you probably have the name, I don't have it off the top of my head, that spoke about offshore wind, said this industry is not inevitable, right? If we don't figure out the supply chain and we don't start to work in that direction, this industry is not inevitable. And that kind of really um, kind of... I don't know, it sombered me a little bit, but then also motivated me as well, as John says. But we um, talked about supply chain and what it means for these businesses. I think it can be a little bit overwhelming. Maybe these businesses think, um, maybe I could engage in the supply chain, but I'm not really sure. But I'm going to go ahead and sign up for the supply chain registry, but then I'm not really sure what happens after that. So we've decided to convene some regional workshops and we'll coordinate with the outreach subcommittee, which we're very <laughs> excited to do and partner with them in their work and convene some regional workshops. We're going to start with kind of an offshore 101, which is if you register, if you think you want to be engaged in this industry, this is where you start and this is how you progress. We thought it might be a little overwhelming if you're a business to say, okay, how do I get from A to Z? And so we thought, let's, let's break this down a little bit and help these businesses understand what's involved, maybe how they can engage, maybe what financing is available for a new product line, help them get more creative about that thought process. And someone mentioned to me the other day, during the pandemic, how resilient and thoughtful our North Carolina businesses were. They just started pivoting and making masks and hand sanitizer and this and that. So we know the creativity is there, we just have to unlock it. So we're gonna start these regional workshops where we can kind of start with an offshore one-on-one, -on -one. 101, this is how you get engaged, this is the process, this is how we bring you along. And then we're going to start, um, we're going to build on that and we're going to bring in our UK delegation and kind of do an advanced workshop and start to see who's advancing along and who's really interested, how we can bring them along, bring in our friends from the UK to talk about their experiences and just kind of build on that as we go. So we're planning those now, we've got a great kind of flow for an agenda for the 101 that involves developers and uh, commerce and different folks. So I think it's going to be a really robust effort and we're, we're looking forward to launching that to see now who has registered and then who we can start to bring along and cultivate to really engage. Very good. As you heard, this is going to be an ongoing um, activity because uh, John from Dominion earlier mentioned that he was he's participated in more than 100 workshops of this type. Now, they were not always business focused, but, um, you know, even though he's done more than 100, I, he's probably just barely scratched the surface. And Ashley, I'm sure you have experience with that as well. Well, they, Dominion has done an excellent job. Yeah. They're, they're business to business especially, so it's fantastic. So yeah, I mean, they're, 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 yeah, it's just outreach, 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 because it's, it is such a new industry for so many people. And they've picked good partners as yeah. well, so don't try to do it alone, find your partner. Okay, very good. Steve Callen, uh, go ahead. You have a comment. Yeah, just with regard to this, can you, can you talk a little bit about how the content of those um, workshops matches up to something like the, the uh, Business Networks Foundations to Blades program? Is this kind of a higher level, or is it at the same level, or what, what do you think? It's, it's going to be at a higher level, um, because number one, I think that's... Um, that's needed at this point. We, we, like Michelle said, we don't want to go A to Z. We're going to do the early part of the alphabet first. And two, I don't think we have the technical expertise to provide the same level of D 
detail that, say, the business network does. But this would be a precursor, I think, to, to that. And we would certainly um, recommend people that, that people that people participate in those as well. <coughs> so um, another activity that this committee is engaged in is um, revamping Commerce's website with respect to offshore wind. We've had a page up for a couple of years now. It's good, but it needs to be re, um, enhanced. And so we are in the process of doing that. It's taking a little bit longer than expected, but I expect by midsummer we will have that up and running. Um, also, we um, have, are continuing to identify targets, and I, by this I mean specific targets, companies in the um, offshore wind supply chain, both international and national companies that we would like to recruit to North Carolina, as well as companies within the state that could pivot. Um, the most tangible ways we've done that recently have been the two conferences that we talked about earlier, the International Partnering Forum, Com Forum Conference, which was in Baltimore in March, as well as the Wind Europe Conference, which was just a couple of weeks ago in Denmark. And so uh, most of that work is led by the EDPNC, the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. But uh, if Anders were here, he could recount um, over a long time period all the different meetings that he has had and is keeping a very detailed list of those contacts and what their questions are and their interest. And Madam Chair, that is it. All right, thank, thank you. you. Any more questions for our Economic uh, Opportunity and Business Development Subcommittee? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, John. And we'll move on to our Workforce and Education Subcommittee with Emily Roach. Oh, and it looks like Andrea is joining. And I want to make one comment, though, before we move to the economic, uh, I mean, about the economic. There was a statement about this industry is not inevitable. I want to challenge that because from that first slide that John put up, the world around us is already doing it. It may not be certain what our benefit or role will be in it, but it's happening <laughs> around the world. So just wanted to make that statement. We're moving on, and Emily, if you would, please proceed with Workforce Education and Training Opportunity Update. Thank you, Chair Walton. Good afternoon. I'm Emily Roach from the Department of Commerce and staff the Workforce Subcommittee. And I'm Dr. Jenny Harris with the Division of Workforce Solutions. And um, I also want to recognize Josh Levy, who is here from the Department of Commerce as well, that also staffs the Workforce Subcommittee. Uh, this is just a quick reminder of our objective as the Workforce and Education Committee. Uh, we, we really set out to make recommendations to the state about best practices uh, to develop the state's uh, offshore wind workforce. Right now, we're focused on bullet points two and three that you see here, which are to identify best practices and to develop uh, partnerships, particularly in clean energy generally, to advance our offshore wind workforce. At the start of this fiscal year, we established three key goals. Our first goal was to conduct a skills analysis in construction and installation occupations. And uh, thanks to, to Josh Levy from, from LEAD, uh, that task is completed. Uh, but we're, as a subcommittee, thinking about how we can leverage the information from that study um, in our next steps and uh, with other stakeholders that are uh, doing similar work uh, that we are. Um, and our uh, second task to develop a training inventory is in progress. Uh, we hope to publish that training inventory soon, but we've got some really great partnerships underway. Um, I'm looking at Steve Callen and his team uh, where we are um, identifying what's out there and uh, sharing information uh, across groups. And um, our third is, of course, underway as well. We're um, constantly uh, highlighting uh, best practices across the state and inviting people to, to uh, join our subcommittee. The skills analysis that uh, LEAD conducted on behalf of the subcommittee and uh, the NREL workforce study, which uh, we received a presentation on from John, John Harden at our last meeting, um, both led to similar recommendations for the state of North Carolina. We really need to um, expand the, the number of 
workers trained in skilled trades and really build on the transferable skills um, that they have. And so to advance this particular recommendation, the subcommittee established two tasks uh, when we met in March. And um, that, that first task was to invite guest speakers to our April subcommittee meeting and really learn what they're already doing uh, to, to train their workforce to make sure it's diverse. Um, and so the, the first speaker that we invited was Van Smith, the Director of Human Resources from LS Cable, and Bobby Piner, uh, who's the Manufacturing Manager from LS Cable. We also saw LS Cable and uh, Dana's presentation that he gave earlier. But um, Van joined us and uh, shared the great work that they're doing in regards to recruitment. They partner with uh, high schools, actually middle schools as well in their area, um, by having job fairs, by going to speak in the schools, they have wonderful partnerships with the community college in the area. They list jobs uh, on ncworks.gov and partner with the career centers. Um, and they offer uh, internships at several uh, layers in the company. They have uh, internships at the corporate leadership level. And they also have engineering internships through NC State's uh, Rural Works Engineering Internship Program. So we enjoyed hearing their best practices. and. Um, look forward to, we have a report due as a task force at the end of this fiscal year and look forward to highlighting some of what they're doing in terms of recruitment in our uh, next report. We also, thanks to, to Steve Callen, um, invited Allison Carr from the Clean Energy Technology Center to talk about their work that they're doing uh, through the Steps for Growth grant program. And uh, Steve's team, they're working on developing uh, educational pyramid models in solar energy um, and wind energy and bioenergy. And so we're really aligning with them. We're going to share uh, the skills analysis and the training inventory and work together to identify those transferable skills that are um, the same across clean energy sectors. So we're excited about that partnership. And Brandy Bragg from NC Pathways also joined us to talk about um, their early work in a multi-state green energy grant. And uh, Perry Harker couldn't be here today, um, one of our subcommittee co-chairs, um, because of a graduation event at Carteret Community College. But Carteret is, is plugged into this grant, and Brandy is going to continue to uh, join our subcommittee meetings. And so. Um, we think that um, where we are now with workforce development, that one of the best things that we can do is make sure that we're really plugged into the uh, clean energy workforce grant programs that are already underway in the state of North Carolina so that we have um, those relationships forged and can apply what we learn uh, to offshore wind workforce development. So Dr. Jenny Harris is going to share um, some of our, our next steps. Um, and some of the things that are currently already underway, as Emily said, um, one of our tasks was to partner with the local workforce board areas that have a certified career pathway in the construction trades. That was one of our areas of occupations that were a priority. Um, currently, uh, Capital Area, Durham, Cartar, which is just north, um, for those that don't know the workforce board names, um, Cartar is just north of Capital Area, and Eastern Carolina, which includes um, Carteret County, Carteret Community College, they currently have career certified career pathways in the construction trades including welding, electrician. Uh, we've talked about those occupations today. The criteria to have a construction um, trade or any career pathway includes priority policies, meaning that you focus on those industries, um, funding dedicated and allocated for that. You have multiple points of entry, so it could be middle and high school aged children that are um, going through CTE programs or any other kind of programs that can learn skills or gain credentials into community college and university levels. Um, that could, and all of that would would contribute to the um, education and training and future job placement of the, those individuals. 
the local uh, workforce areas are also interested, there are some that are also interested in developing clean energy career pathways. And so the feedback from them on that, um, although there is one regional partnership for energy, not necessarily clean energy, but it's great that they're already thinking about it. Um, some of the feedback is that they need support, they need staffing and they need um, finances to make that happen. And so we hear that loud and clear. So one of the things that um, as a next step is that we would like to make the, or we will be making the recommendation to draft um, an outline for the clear en clean energy career pathway for certification by the NC Works Commission. They're the ones that certify those pathways. And then some of the additional tasks that um, for consideration um, for our committee to discuss through the next for, through the rest of the year is to host employer roundtables. I've heard other people say that today, and we're hoping um, to talk to Gina soon and her outreach committee, and potentially some of the um, task force members who are already aware of other employer roundtables that are happening around offshore wind to partner with them and other partner agencies that are having employer uh, roundtables to talk to them uh, to get their feedback on what credentials they want to see, what um, skills they want to see, and at different levels. Uh, we, the, <coughs> excuse me, additional tasks also include making recommendations to our workforce partners about key offshore wind um, occupations to focus um, to identify those uh, short-term, long-term credentials and to add those to the credentials list of NC Careers, My Future NC, and others that are compiling cred uh, priority credentials lists. And then finally also to publish this offshore wind uh, training inventory to the NC Towers website. Any questions? Do we have any questions for a workforce subcommittee? We were in that winding down mode. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Harris, and thank you, Emily. Well, that brings us to the portion of our meeting for task force members to talk about what we've heard today, what we've learned, any questions, any comments, thoughts. Um, and you heard Emily mention we do have a report due to the governor and legislature legislature in June, I believe, is our uh, due date. We will be asking our subcommittees who do all of this great work. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who's contributing to our subcommittees. Um, we'll be pulling together some of those key points of recommendation. And so if you can begin thinking about that and working in your various subcommittees to start drafting some recommendations to submit, we will be pulling that together very soon. Someone is signaling me and I don't have glasses on. Oh, um, parking okay. validation. John Soka? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my first meeting, new one pointed. I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I think that today was very useful for me personally. I learned a lot. I think that the uh, task force is doing great work here uh, and needs to continue. Um, but I, there's a couple of things that struck me today that came out in some of the presentations. And uh, John Harden really hit the nail on the head when he asked the panel, uh, how do you deal with rate payers and costs? What do you think about them? And there were various answers to them. But from, uh, I am a recovering politician, so I'm not legislature anymore. But um, as chair of the Energy Committee in the House, primary thing I was concerned about was how much the ratepayers pay for electricity. We live in the southeast, and in the southeast, I think we have, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Mark, but we have the lowest energy rates for consumers and businesses and industry in the southeast, and one of the lowest throughout the nation. So when we compare ourselves to, say, Massachusetts or New York and say, well, they can do it up there, why aren't we doing it down here? It's a different rate structure they pay, in some cases, significantly more than we do. So we have to be very aware of that, to, that when we make comparisons of our state to other states, that we're truly looking at all the factors, not just that we all live on this continent and, and we all pay the same rate because we don't. So 
Uh, I, I bring that up because uh, there's that little bill, House Bill 951. And I'll bring it up because I was a primary sponsor of it. <laughs> but I'm bringing it up because the, the wording in there, I think, is very important is to, to where the state goes with wind, with small modular reactors, with any other type of energy that's going, because that specifically doesn't mention wind and small nuke in here. It talks about the carbon plan. Well, everybody here is familiar with it, but I think it would pay a little dividend maybe to go back and, and just reread a portion of this, because I have a suggestion on something that we can do for the next time the uh, carbon plan gets talked about, and interveners, when they come in, they can file cases and all that other stuff. So develop a plan, blah, 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 including stakeholder input for the utilities to achieve the authorized reduction goals, and we all know what those are, which may, permissive, at a minimum, means there can be more, consider power generation, transmission and distribution, grid modernization, storage, energy efficiency measures, demand side management, and the latest technological breakthroughs to achieve the least cost path consistent with this section to achieve compliance with the authorized carbon reduction goals. So it didn't put a lid on what has to be considered in the carbon plan. Other things may be considered. And I heard a number of different things today, uh, comments one way or another, the way I interpret them was that it's obvious to us that we should have wind. It, it, there's benefits to us as humans, there's benefits to us as a state, things like that. Well, whatever those other intangible benefits are, because the way the law is worded, can be brought up. I think we need to think a little bit about what some of those intangible benefits could be and try and put some kind of cost to them. Because just because something's intangible doesn't mean you can't come up with some type of way, a formula, to say it's worth this to us. I, I don't know what that is. I, I'm just here today, this is kind of like my stream of thought. But I, I think we might think about that, because even if we don't make a difference this year, the carbon plan gets looked at every two years. And if interveners, if Duke, if somebody else can help figure that out, I think it will really more uh, closely meet the intent of the law, because that is the intent of the law. And it was permissive, and it wasn't capped at anything, because we wanted it. We wanted people to think about it, but so far I haven't read, seen, heard anything, and I don't read everything, but about anybody trying to capture those type of factors and, and apply to the carbon plan in a way that is clear and it can have money. Okay, so that's, I'll, I'll leave that for a minute. Um, yeah, the legislature is very interesting. You, you choose one or two things as a legislator, and I was in the House, that, that catch your fancy. For me, it was taxes, broadband, and energy. I didn't go up there because of energy, but it really caught my interest, and I really studied a lot about it, and, you know, I did some good things, some not so good things, but I, but I really got into it. The issue is that I was kind of like a unicorn, because energy is one of those things that, unless you grow up in it and do keep, it's not something people usually pick up and understand. You rely on people to do other things. Education, don't ask me about education. I've had plenty, but in education policy, not my thing. I rely on other members up there. There's very few legislators in either the House or the Senate who actually understand energy, to even the small extent I understand it. So my concern here is, is that the, the good work that's being done in, in reaching out to the public, uh, in reaching, you know, these business roundtables, talking to businesses, things like that. That work's not getting back to legislators. Uh, when I was there, I, you know, frankly, I didn't really, I kind of knew what NC Towers was a little bit, but until I got invited <laughs> to be on it, I, I didn't really know. I, hell, I should have known. I mean, I, I, I was head of the Energy Committee and the Joint Committee with the Senate. I was the chair of that. I didn't know. So all the good work that's being done needs to be funneled back to individual legislators somehow. And, uh, and I got a suggestion for that too. That when the business roundtables are held, when, when people go out and visit companies, uh, if you're going to have something with three or four businesses in a legislator's district, invite, invite that representative, invite that senator. 
Uh, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. Invite them. Get them there. <laughs> Will they come? I, I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe. But what moves policymakers, elected policymakers, uh, if, if they have the right motivations, if they're trying to do the right thing for the people uh, that they represent, whether it's uh, a city mayor, whether it's uh, you know the president of the United States, you have to believe that everybody's trying to do the right thing. But it's very difficult to find out what people are thinking because most constituents don't pick up the phone and call unless something's going wrong. And, and I, I've had plenty of those calls. They never come up and say, hey, John, you know, you did a great job on that bill. Thanks a lot. It, it doesn't happen. I mean, I got stopped in the grocery store all the time about, hey, you know, you did that. I don't like it. And you suck. It's like, oh, thank you very much. Can I go with us and talk to you? If you want to make a difference, you have to get to the people who cast the vote, who pass the laws. And every time we have one of these things, invite the legislators, whether they show up or not, doesn't matter. Uh, take some pictures, ask the people who are there, make sure the people who are there know who their legislators are. You can give them their emails, ask them to send an email. And not a form email that says, thank you very much for showing up. It's, you know, an individual thing. I got thousands of form emails, and I never, I'd read one and then delete the rest because it doesn't matter. What I read was, I read individual me emails, and I was a little weird, I actually responded to individual emails, and individual written letters that got mailed to the General Assembly, I read those too. So, and that really goes to the third point, which is aligned to that, is um, when you go for a business meeting or you talk to businesses, it really shouldn't be a one and done for that person that you're touching because this is an opportunity, a $160 billion supply chain opportunity. I would love to have it in North Carolina. It's not guaranteed right now. The people who can make it happen, in addition to everybody doing all the hard work here, are the people whose finger presses a green button or a red button up in Raleigh. And there's only 170 of them, 120 in the House and 50 in the Senate. If you get the majority of them on board, and yeah, party does make a difference here too, um, because whoever's in the majority now might not be in the majority next time, but if they are, you gotta accept life as it is, not as you want it to be. So if you don't like the people in charge, get over it. You need to talk to them too. So when you talk to, to the people out in the districts and all this place, get them on your email list and then ask them every once in a while to go back and talk to their legislators in the home district. That's where it really makes a difference. I mean, I kind of made light of the people coming up to me in the grocery store. <laughs> Hell, it still happens. I still think I'm up there. It's like, hey, I don't do that anymore. But um, it makes a difference. It really does. And don't be afraid of anybody in the legislature. They don't bite. Um, but there is a hill to be climbed there it might slobber a little bit down by itself. <laughs> Hopefully we don't have a big nationwide audience listening to this. But, um, but I hope I've made my point here because there's a lot of work that's been great that's been done by this group so far. And just today I learned a lot. And there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great things. But well, we got to go that extra step and make sure that the people who make the decisions, who might vote for however uh, many millions to do something to improve Radio Island or to do whatever, that they know, not everything that we know, because they're not going to know about that, but they have to know that the people who they represent care about when. And if the people they represent don't care about when, we're all kind of wasting our time. Um, but, but that's... As a politician, I've talked too long, so I will turn off the mic, but thank you. Not too long at all. We appreciate all of your comments, and I think we would all say you're preaching to the choir for the most part. Um, certainly take all of that to heart, and thank you. It, it is work that we have been trying to do to a great extent, and um, haven't given up. We're still trying. And in fact, I might invite Mayor Cahoon, if you want to talk about from an outreach and engagement um, perspective, what we've done with legislators and um, all of the events that we've done so far. We have. Um, 
There we go. So um, we have done that for our round tables and um, the, uh, the open house. We've had those local legislators on our invite list. So they haven't always shown up. <laughs> but, um, you know, in particular at the, uh, at the open house, we had an extensive list. We, we got all the, again, a little bit different from your point, which is well taken, but we made sure that every uh, local county commissioner, uh, mayor, town manager, all those folks got an invitation to that. Not many of them showed up, but we we made the effort, and, and it wasn't a token effort. We didn't make that, we didn't make that effort. But I, as a fellow with a smaller scale politician, I accept your point. You're, you're exactly right. We, uh, um, we can be uh, make sure that we're really diligent about and we do have a lot more work to do in that area, so I appreciate your comments, and we will certainly take that into heart as we move forward. Any other thoughts or comments? I think most of our members have trickled out on us, so I'll move winding down. So just a few comments. I do want to, again, thank East Carolina University, Pitt Community College, and Pitt County Economic Development for sponsoring our breakfast and lunch today and also that uh, Pirates popcorn that kept us a bit distracted and, <laughs> and kept some of us here this afternoon. So that was really good. Our next meeting is August 3rd, and uh, we don't have our location confirmed yet, but just note the date and please save the date. We will have our third quarterly meeting on August 3rd. Are there any, and let me just go to, you know, we don't have, uh, any questions from our virtual members? Nicole is reminding me to tell everyone if you need your parking ticket validated, please see her to get your parking validated. And any final thoughts or comments, Steve? And we're going to get a final group photo, so we'll ask you to stay just two more minutes. Oh, we, we get that done. I want to thank everyone. Uh, this has been a long day. It always is, but I hope you got a lot out of it. We did have quite a bit packed in today, and uh, we will probably do the same thing again next time. But uh, thank you, and this meeting is officially adjourned.